thing. <laughs> By the lucky truck. Oh, man. Okay. Well, you need a... Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Yep. All right. Good morning, everybody. We'll go, if everybody's ready, we'll go and call this meeting to order. Um, thank you, everybody, for showing up today. We uh, unfortunately will not have Ron. He's okay himself. He's dealing with some family matters. Um, but uh, we're going to have a co-, co uh, Secretary is taking the minutes today, so thank you all for doing that. We'll do our best. Yeah. No guarantees. So throw the tomatoes <laughs> that direction. But, Ooh, <laughs> but compared to last meeting, it's a big packet. Our packet's a little bit smaller today. I looked so. at this. Wow. <laughs> Give me up my lunch. So it's a, a little welcome relief from the last one and uh, a lot of the same comments that we can address, but we'll try to, to march through it today and maybe get out a little bit earlier. Uh, but we'll go ahead and start uh, with the public comment on non-agenda items. Do have any comments from the public on any non-agenda items? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move forward. Next, we have an update on pending legislation that could impact the contract forms. And I'm not sure, I understand we don't have a formal presentation today on that, but uh, does anybody want to discuss any of the bills that were circulating the materials for the meeting? Uh -huh. Any particular comments you'd like to bring up? We can go through those. Sure. Yes. So this is everybody's supplemental agenda item three that came from Amber after the original packet came on February twenty second. So there's several bills that Trek is launching. And this is just the highlights. And as you know, the session is just not even midway. So none of these have passed. I don't think there's even status on here. I don't know that any of them are even in hearings yet. It's committees pretty, meet it's, hearing I have just started like just started. within the last week. I right. mean, even if I'm not even sure that we've seen a, a hearing for any of the bills we're calling. Right. So it, very well, it's March 8th. It's March 8th, isn't it, before anything, the committee really starts working? I think it's March 8th when committee actually starts working. It may be. Stuff. Some of these were filed early, though. And so I think I think there's a 60 days after they were filed. But, but in any event, they're nowhere near done, and none of them are, like, going to the governor. So um, I'm just talking a couple of these myself. But anyway, as you can see here, there's some new potential seller's disclosures Mm -hmm. that if they pass, then of course those would affect us and our uh, need to amend the statutory seller's disclosure that we promulgate. So that's House Bill 697 regarding fuel gas piping in a residential real property. That ought to be real fun. Is that considered like five natural gas in my home? That's what they're meaning. Um, I think they mean across the property. Oh, no, that mean like your backyard, you got a pipeline going under your... Which, I'm yes. not sure how in the world a seller's going to do that. No, we know. But, but I haven't read that bill, but I will. But anyway, we'll, we'll know. If it passes, we'll know. And I'm sure that one's going to get a lot of commentary. Um, so House Bill 1057 is um, restrictions on the purchase of a single-family home by an investment firm. So people are trying to keep... Um, some of the single family homes being purchased by single families um, really doesn't affect any of the forms. But we're monitoring it right now. Uh, it may affect the one four family that gets through. It would be incredibly difficult. It would be. Yeah. Because we in Texas think that entities are people. We, right. we say they're people. Um, so House Bill 1075 is relating to certain property interests of the foreign government and agricultural land. I will tell you this has got a quasi-sister bill and Senate Bill 147, which is also yeah. on this list. But these bills are, are prohibiting a foreign government or a company owned or controlled by a foreign government from purchasing or leasing ag land which is defined in the bill um, it doesn't apply to any ownerships before 8 23 of course that date is the date before most of the bills become effective um, but if it's leased land if there's an existing lease uh, that existing lease will run but no renewals and there's really not 
anything at the moment, you know, but again, might be the farm and ranch or unimproved property contract, but we'll have to see what happens. Is that going to be sort of like the thing where the buyer has to say if the seller's a foreign person? Kind That's, of thing? That the is a very... The reverse, I mean, yeah. you know yeah. But actually, on that note, and what's way ahead of it, but John and I were discussing that before the meeting, and, and if we needed to, that would be a logical place in the contracts to put it, you know, the firm to disclosure yeah. and the I am or am not. And paragraph 20 to have subsections, things that way we keep the same number. Right. So it's going to put the burden on the seller to know who's buying it. Well, well the burden on how the buyer yeah, to disclose there's, there's it. Been discussion. Okay. And actually, okay. just since we're on that one, I'm going to flip back over to 147 again. These are not twin bills. These are not paired bills. The uh, SB 147, which is on the... It's specifically named. It specifically named certain countries uh, and prevents Chinese, Iranian, North Korean, or Russian, Russian government entities, citizens, or companies from purchasing real property of any type in Texas. So... Um, Senator Cole, of course, is sponsoring that one, and it's getting a lot of traction. So, I am going to ask this question. I'm sorry. I, like, I really want to wait until these are done, but does Texas state law not have to follow federal? I mean, can it be in conflict? <clears throat> Fair housing law says that you can't prohibit a citizen, which is what's here. No, these are citizens so, of another country. Yeah. That's I, think protect, I think protected glass <laughs> are only for are only citizens of the United States. Right. Yeah. We don't protect them. It's, it's national, national, it's national yeah. origin. It's not citizen of. So if you naturalize from from Russia, you you're a U.S. citizen. Right, and that's okay. wouldn't apply to you. But if you're a that's citizen of Russia, citizenship. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> yeah, 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 there's a lot of these, these, are, these are wonderful <laughs> questions, and these, uh, hopefully these the legislature all will be all um, thinking about them. I mean, they, 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 they allow they to do it now, right? Right, because there's no rule on it, and yeah. so the states are trying to do it. Yeah, it is. Um, That's a good question. I don't know. I'm not going to opine on that. Nobody's paying me right but, now. Yeah, that's I'm not going to do what they want to do. Did, before we go on, did you have a comment on one she already went over? Well, no, I was just going to say, I'm on, uh, this year, I'm back for one of quite a number of terms on the uh, reptile of the Real Estate Probate mm -hmm. Trust Law section of the State Bar Legislative Committee. And we fire up the big, we have you know, a group of about a dozen members, and we fire up the big uh, lobbyist computer system to keep track of our bills. About 2,000 bills that affect real estate are flagged each year. We get maybe 200 of them per attorney, and then we have to go through them all. From long experience, usually you don't really see much until May, <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of April, May. And uh, the serious bills, you know, you have, I mean, I could probably spot serious bills, you know, that will sponsor anything TAR sponsors is almost always a serious bill. And uh, I've had legislatures tell me that if there's no serious opposition to TAR from another lobbying group, it's, it's, it, it's probably going to go through. Okay. So. Well, Thank since you. Robin's here... <laughs> is the we'll, we'll TAR, we'll the uh, is TAR taking you. a position on anything yet? I'm not aware of. I, I know that that specific bill that you were just discussing is a is a big item that we are watching and working with the authors on getting some additional information on how that would look because our members uh, have concerns. Some of the members from the representation committee meetings begin in March, so yeah. it hasn't been looked at, and so and it is. I don't remember the the uh, lieutenant governor's list of priority bills. I don't remember that that was on it specifically. I can't. Recall. It was on a prior I, list. He stopped talking about it. Is that right? Well, that's been in the national media as well. Yeah. Uh, well was the top seven, top ten? Yeah. Yeah. So back to the list so we can move on. So again, um, back on the HBs on the first page. So uh, 1256 is another seller's disclosure uh, potential. It's concerning special districts um, like MUDs and so forth. So if, if that's changed. In the statute, then we'll change our seller's disclosure, and TR may do whatever they do more <laughs> extensively. Uh, HB 1257, again, seller's disclosure.
disclosure notice, special district ad valorem taxes or assessments on newly constructed residential real properties. And so that's specific for new construction and might affect our new home contract or potentially the new home contract with incomplete construction. HB 1336 is relating to the ownership by a landowner of the geothermal energy and associated resources below the surface of the landowner's land. They're trying to um, statutorily declare that the landowner owns those assets since that's not been declared before. Um, HP 1756 uh, concerns deposit fees and charges for tenants and prospective tenants related to a residential lease and it amends the definition of security deposits and if that happens we will probably have to look at it for our sellers temporary residential leases <coughs> and buyers temporary residential leases as you know track does not promulgate a regular residential lease form at this time and has no plans to um, good but good to know hb 1820 uh, landlord's right to enter the dwelling of a residential tenant i would say this can always be overwritten by the written lease but they're wanting to um, make a statute that there's got to be 24 hours written notice given to a tenant before a landlord can come in unless there's an emergency. Again, if that happens, maybe our, res our temporary <coughs> doctor. It's been best practices be there. I mean, that's been best practices. It's, a, it's a best practice, but it's almost impractical because they'll call and raise all kind of hell. You don't have this fixed. You don't have that done. You didn't do this. You're like, okay, I'm showing up to do it. Not now. You're not coming over now. Like, okay, and then the next day, why did you fix it? I mean, it's a never-ending survey. Yeah, right. yeah. A little whirlpool. Okay, for the litigators in the room, HB 2022 is bringing back Chapter 27 of the Texas Property Code, which is the um, notices and cure requirements for residential construction liability. Or the old RCLA that was and then died, but the notices stayed. <coughs> so this is some more notices. Um, amendment modifications. So if that happens, maybe track thinks maybe we need to look at the new home contract and the new home contract with incomplete construction to see once these get through, if they get through, if we need to add anything. Um, we have a notice already on about chapter 27 near the signature line on those contracts, so maybe that needs to be amended if it happens. HP 2020, I'm sorry, 2260 is seller's disclosure and the location of certain real property in a floodplain. So more floodplain. This will be three legislative sessions in a row that the ledge has talked about the floodplain and disclosures. And this is specifically talking about a property of less than 15 acres without a current residence. Um, so, and the person is, I don't know how this is practical, but the notice is supposed to include a copy of the current flood insurance rate map, et cetera, et cetera. And for fun, this is going to provide a statutory recovery to a buyer who gets damaged within five years after they buy a property where disclosures weren't made. Huh. If that gets through. Well, current statute limitations is two years. Um, no, it's four. Well, it's, it depends. There's breach no. of contract for four. There's DTPA. There's fraud. There's you know. There's all kinds of things. Or should reasonably know. So, yeah. yeah. So that's an interesting thing. This is I would call that a statute of repose. Okay. But um, we'll see if that happens. That seems like it's got a lot of moving parts in it. All right. SB 147. We already talked about. That's specifically targeted at the certain uh, enemy state <laughs> persons and companies and governments. SB 711 um, relates to the purchase or other acquisition of title to real property by prohibited foreign actors related but not exactly. Um, and that's going to be defined to include businesses or individuals 
this is under the annual threat assessment. So that'll be fun. There'll be annual updates to that. Um, they can't acquire title and real property without providing written notice at least 10 days prior to closing. Requires TREC to develop the form used to provide the written notice and the bill dictates specific elements that must be included in the notice. The bill would authorize the seller to revoke any promise to sell the property on receipt of the written notice and requires a court to dismiss any suit against the seller for termination of a sale based on the notice and stipulates that no damages can be recovered against the seller. Um, again, if this passes, there'll be a new notice form. I also, my personal comment is, again, this has a long way to go to work out some kinks, but since the legislature is specifically calling on track to develop a form, that certainly would impact this committee. So SB 6, I'm sorry, 864 is relating to certain sellers' disclosures for the sale of residential real property concerning gas lines, again. gas lines again. This is not an exact twin, but similar to the HP, the house bill that we talked about already. And I'm certain if more come up, we'll hear about them before our next meeting, which if the next meeting is in June and we don't have any special sessions, then we will be able to talk about the bills that pass. But if there's a special session or another special session or another special session, we may not have all the bills or any of the bills yet. But thanks to Trek for putting this together. And thank you, SJ, for presenting it. <laughs> you, um, there will be a lot of changes there going forward, but it'd be an interesting legislative session, that's for sure. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next topic of discussion regarding notice of statutory termination rights in contract forms, including termination rights to statutory tax, tax districts. <laughs> and I think this is a, it, it's a past comment that's been around for a while, but we've had some new stuff happen. I think it relates to like the new pit notice in the MUDs. So just to set the table, of course, the MUDs been around for a long time. If you don't provide it at or before you execute the contract, the buyer can terminate at any time prior to closing. The new PIDs operate similarly, but a little different. It's if you don't provide it at or before you, the time you execute the contract, the buyer is up to seven days after you provide the form to terminate. And I think the comment here was discussion of do we need to put those termination rights in the contract itself to spell them out? And especially with now that they're varying. The MUD was pretty simple and straightforward that you can terminate all the way through closing, but now we have a different one with the PID. In the notice, does it provide that information? I don't believe it's actually provided in the notice. Okay. In itself. our sales disclosure notice? No, I'm talking about, well, in the, there's a special municipal utilities, the MUD notice. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. right. And those are prescribed by the, the terminology by statute. Okay. Right? So we're right. following our notice follows what's in the statute. Right. It's, uh, we don't have a MUD notice, but yeah. our, our PID, PID notice, notice does uh, the, follow the statute. Does the PID notice say they have seven days after receipt? I don't believe so. I'm just curious because if that's the thing, we're not informing. You know, um, you know. And, and there's a lot of questions. <laughs> this past week alone, I had two questions on, well, do emergency service districts fall within, oh. you know, either one of those? And I, the answer to that, I'm, I believe, is no. You know, those are more like school districts in terms of tax taxation. But there's a lot of confusion <laughs> out there on, you know, what these termination rights are and what falls within them and what doesn't. And so, you know, teeing up the question, do we want to go further to add more language about the termination rights in there, or is it more of an education issue? Where if we start spelling, in my mind, if we start spelling it out, our contracts are just going to balloon. Yeah. And if, if the legislature thought it was important enough to tell people about those termination rights, they would have put it in the notice language to begin Not with. Not only that, if they change the notice right from seven to six days, we got to be sure we see that, you know, it becomes a... I think these are two very important issues that do need to be spelled out in the contract. If we spell out things regarding uh, fixture leases and residential leases to the extent of the space that it takes, these are in the property code and the water code, and all the contract right now does is direct the consumer or the agent to the water code or to the property code. And I think we owe it to both the consumer and the agent to spell it out because it's just such serious. So. And it's a good right for the consumer, but it's also one that could be used 
in, inappropriately and to leave it just to education. It would be wonderful to think that the 18 hours everybody gets every two yeah. years is sufficient and we know it's not. <laughs> So I think it needs, uh, I very feel very strongly that it needs to be in the document. It is one of the most powerful termination rights in the whole contract. Yeah. I mean, that, that's available. And we have on the screen the, the actual that's, PID, yeah. the PID notice. Um, and so uh, in practice, with the from the broker's perspective, do, do your agents know about these termination rights? Do they talk about them with their clients? Or no. Is this no. If they take legal one and two, and they've got an instructor who takes the time to really focus on these, but for example, in Houston regarding the water district notice, it's an HAR, Houston Association of Realtors right. form. Right. So there isn't a promulgated form by either Trek or Texas Realtors. So they know to use it. But, and it does say uh, on the form that is to be completed before, because that's what the attorneys for HAR did. But that's, that's the only place that's there. Uh, I don't know what the rest of the state may have the opportunity to use, but I think because it does have such con um, ability to terminate, if not done, and the onus falls back on the agent if they don't know to do it. And yes, every agent should know, but do they? No. So it's an well, MLS that's rule. That's a given. Oh, well, yeah. We have 150,000 to put it up. It's, it, it's true, but I go to what you just said. It's such an important uh, and significant ability to terminate that goes to the water code and the property code. We need to take the lines to add that to protect the consumer and, and to help the agent. I see it crop up a lot. If you look at the water district map in the Texas was TCEQ has a great water district map that's interactive. You can go down the street level and see it, but you can zoom out. And they're in clusters in the state, right? And certain parts of the state have no floods. And the agents in those areas generally don't know, right. you know, you know about the procedures because they never have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And when they come and they need to be geographically competent, as we're really pushing, you know, Trek's pushing right now, but a lot of them are, right? And so when they list in Houston or deal with properties in Houston or other areas that have a lot of water districts, they don't know about that. And that's where I see people getting caught up quite a bit mm -hmm. on that. Um, yeah, in my much. mind, you know, it's education and first contract, but do we want to consider putting in that and where would we put that in? Maybe an addendum? Because not everybody's in a bud district. Well, that's what I was wondering. Or it just be added. added to what? There's not not this is just a notice, but mm -hmm. could we add it, some language in here advising them of that? Mm -hmm. in this addendum, and then it's sure. included. Calling on PID, you can't have the form, right? But the municipal utilities so district is not Let me ask there. a question. The MUD districts, those are pay improvement districts too, true? I mean, there's in tax, there's yes. tax. <clears throat> and why, why, why aren't, why isn't HAR, why aren't the Houston people using this versus the other? Because it has to be well, done. No, no, no. Uh, two different things. Okay. HAR does not the uh, water district notices. The PID district, which I think is what you're referring to, well, that's a trek form, so of course they would use that. Two different entities. Well, remember, there's three different versions of the MUD notice, too. I mean, we don't, we don't promulgate it, but there's one for in the city, one for in the uh, unincorporated county, one in the ETJ. And it, it's the same top and bottom with different guts in the middle. But then they have to go and find from the water district the numbers to put in there, and there's lots of confusion on that. And so we don't have a form that we can just insert the termination rights. We, we, we don't have a PID notice for from us, from TREC. So have it had to be in the contract or an addendum. Water district notice? What's that? Have we ever thought of doing a water well, district it, notice? It's in the it's a one to four, right, about the... There is a line, right? We, we did add the, the line. line. Right. We added the line, so it's. We put something FYI. in Farmer Ranch, a little blip in Farmer Ranch. I think so. Yeah. So we, we've oh, done. That's, yeah. As a as a just a general statement, it seems to me that we're talking about a myriad of different notices that the burden is upon a seller to provide that, right? right. And to put it to either give it before the contract is signed or in the contract. I don't know that we need 
to have anything in the contract form. It's more of a situation where there there needs to be the education, and it would be really nice to have some sort of, for for Texas Realtors, for example. I, and I'm not meaning to pick on them, but to have a standard form for sellers to check. You know, you need to investigate whether your property is subject to these following things. Check this, 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 this. And if you do, you need to attach a notice. But I don't know that we need to put a checkbox in the contract I or anything like that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm not adamantly opposed to putting something in the contract, but I am very concerned about adding something to the contract. Because for one thing, we've had this conversation about different topics over the past 10 years that I've been here. And there's lots of places in the contract where we refer the reader to the property code or you know something else. And that's, that's just the way we do it, as opposed to rewriting the law into the contract. I mean, the contract, bottom line, the contract isn't for education. The contract is for that agreement between the parties so um i would i would be very <coughs> hesitant about adding a bunch of language to this and i would also say i think often we forget that these contracts are being used by people that don't have a real tour and they don't have a license holder and they don't have an attorney and i don't want to set a precedent where they're reading along and going oh well the contract will explain to me anything i need to know and then they get somewhere else and they and it's only a reference and they don't go follow up so but on that vein i mean i think the way we have done it which is on the screen i think the layman looks for blanks to fill in right yeah. they, just, they skip all that other words it's too much so they just get right to the blanks. And so, you know, we have in six this required notice with the blanks that says the notices have been given or are attached. For example, MUD, WCIB, PID, et cetera. I don't know. <clears throat> and to me, that would, if I was a lay person, hopefully say, oh, here's a blank. I need to look at this. Or do I need to fill this in? Or what is this? What are these required notices? I, I guess the question would be, okay, I'm going to be ornery as a burger. Realtors don't read the contract. Let's go over there. There's a lot of people that just look in the blank, just as, you know, as mm -hmm. the public does, as realtors do. They know how to hit tab. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I hate to say that on a broker. I see it all the time. Um, but, so, I don't know if that checkbox would even matter because they wouldn't know. I think it's more, you know, on the education of what is the PID, and that's what I'm seeing when I teach legal. When I teach legal, that's the big conversation because they don't even ask those questions until all of a sudden their buyer can't qualify because there's an assessment that has changed their whole loan because of the PID. And they're like, well, what a PID? And I'm like, oh my goodness. That's just well, an argument, argument for more It's kind of like a right? I think what they're talking about is. For the people that aren't getting the education, meaning the lay person who's pulling these contracts, she's saying they they need to be stick to being accustomed to going and looking at the water code, right. the mud code. And SJ is saying, yeah, but we want this lay person to fill in this blank. So if we give them a blank, it's going to force them to figure out what the water district is. Not the agents getting trained, the lay people. What I don't about know if it'll it'll be be or are we just a check mark? <laughs> so just to throw something out, if, if we went down the road of adding something to the contract, if, Esther, can you put the um, 6011 back up? Yep. Just, it's just as an, a thought that it's not long, but could be helpful. At the, for example, MUD, WCID, PID notices, period. Failure to provide such notices could impact the party's rights under the contract or termination rights or just a little mm -hmm. tag on exactly. sentence. That Something. is, it's not <clears throat> saying it what it is, but a notice kind of like yes. consult an attorney or. Yes, exactly. It's yes. not education in the contract, it's information. And I think exactly what you're talking about is the warning that there are ramifications for potential terminate loss of rights without providing the form in a timely manner, whatever. I think it needs to be a statement, not a blank, not a box, just information. Well, we just added there, but have we gotten off of the topic, though? Yeah, well, it's regarding notice, statutory termination rights in the contract form, so that's... 
We're in including the tax. Yeah, so yeah. this water okay. district, which is a tax, and PID, which is an assessment. So I think we're talking about both. So, yeah, I think, I mean, required notices. Maybe we also need to say add more to the list. You know, there's that lifelong argument of lists, of including when you when you make too many items in a list, it implies that there are no more. Well, we started this language in the last meeting of mm -hmm. wanting to give a blank one to call people's attention to the fact that these notices need to be provided and to give evidence of the actual that they actually provided the the notices to the other side. And we, we had the, you know, some of it and PID is already in paragraph 22 as well. And so we had a big debate on two different places. The side is best heaven to then and then look at how that plays out. But um, I, I'm I'm not opposed to adding something like that there because it, it, it does. Can we look at the tax one too before we see if it's. I like this. OK, so uh, Brian has a suggested language here that's warning a seller's failure to give certain statutory uh, warning may or warnings warnings may provide buyers with certain remedies, including the right to terminate the contract. May statutory notices maybe. Um, uh, or right. Instead of warning. I think you want to say warning and a notice. notice. Required, and if we if it's in the paragraph that says required notices, maybe I'll say certain notice. required notices. I think just that is and that's not very long, and it, it mm -hmm. does. That is one of the most powerful rights outside the. the it's essentially another option that they don't provide. Yeah, and it's just not the right to terminate. There are rights to for damages. Did you say that's including right. termination? Yes, mm -hmm. certain remedies, including the right to terminate. Do you want to put the language? Yeah, do you, you want to? Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to go yeah. to medical school. That kind of substitutes for a. So, what you're telling me is I'm not going to be able to read this? <laughs> <laughs> you want to do it? You got it? Warning. A seller's failure to give. Certain notices words, not used may provide buyers with certain remedies, comma, including the right to terminate the contract. I think the second certain can come out. Okay, okay. so you want to share your screen, right? Yeah, let yes. me get this started and, and I will unshare. Well, and that warning may prompt people to self-educate. Right? Yeah. The, well, a termination yeah. right? What, what termination right? Um, or yeah, self-medicate. So <laughs> <laughs> or both. One. Uh, I like that better than doing it. Yeah, one one layer layer layer. So, yeah. I like that a lot better. Or just drag it over there too. Mm -hmm. I think you just pick it down at your... I mean, something we wouldn't have to change over time, right? It would fit kind of any of these notices that come in and out. Yeah, exactly. That was what it was highlighting for mine. Like down here, somewhere, somewhere that's. What you say, Abby, I don't know what else to do. I flipped on that. <laughs> I think I heard my name down there. I heard the good broker. Well, here's the here's the language. If you want to, no way. There's the language, John. Do you want me to like put it in the rest of the contract language? The no, I think we can look at this and or I guess where this would fall. That'd be good to. Maybe it's copied the entire 6011. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd take out the second circle. Oh, really? 
I don't know. It's sort of. I hate. I hate it when you say the same thing twice. Uh, you know, they're trying to decide where they think it should go. What I'm saying could it be just right in the front of all the notices? Yeah. To give notices. So it's got the blank. You want the second? I'd take out the second, certain. But I'm, so is this where you want it? Because there would be blanks right here. This is where they were. Blank, yeah. blank, 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 blank. Or you do the blanks after, or you could do the blanks before. Or, or the warning. Well, you want it in a parenthetical? Kind of like the warning below. Maybe bold yeah. it and put it below mm -hmm. the lines. So, yeah, that's good. The whole thing bolded? I was looking for other ways we did it in the contract, and there's there's one where we bold. Instead of warning, have notice, and that's bolded. And then the rest is. What we're referring to notice is. Is that going to be confusing? They're talking yeah, about yeah. notice regarding. They're talking notice. about like this. Yeah. Like that? Exactly. That's under. Oh, that's so those points are requiring to be put in notices? Look where it is. Yes, that's. Yes. And you just write them in like kid, mud, or whatever else we may have some more. Under 7A, we have something similar. It says the notice buyer should determine the availability of utilities to the property is suitable to satisfy buyer's needs. And that's how we did it there. <laughs> and we still haven't talked about the tax either. Are you talking about the one that added to the tax district? Because I'm thinking that would. You want to add it as an example? Yeah, I mean, so on. on yeah, I was just a huge fan of it. 6E3 is statutory tax districts. It's property oh. situated in utility or other statutory created district providing water surge. Blah, 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 blah. Requires is this the PID back in seller to just deliver to buyer side, yeah, which is sign a statutory notice related to the tax rate. Bonded right. indebtedness or standby yep. fee is in 22. District yeah. prior to. See, those notices what are also in 22, so would we take them out of 22? No, only the PID. Only the PID is. And so that's what, last time we had that discussion, whether to leave it in both, and we even discussed it, you know, post-meeting to make sure the minutes were right, and it was, um, we decided to see how it plays out. It's better to have it two places than try to just move it. So it's hard to, we're, why we decided to leave it in two, and the PID in two at least, was we don't want to put all the other check boxes for the MUD and the WCID down in 22. Would we be? It has raised a little confusion in the field. Like that means you got to put it in both places, right? Then yeah, you really do. Yeah. Check the box to 22 and then add it here. And then in my thought, of what's the harm if it's only in one place, right? Somebody going to say, oh, you didn't check the box there, or you didn't list it. You know, if it's in the other well, place, does check that... the box? So, so uh, to address, I think where you were going with the statute with the tax mm -hmm. funds. So I'm wondering, do we? want to just add and this may cause more problems than it helps so I'm, you can shoot this down but what if you just had added a 12 with a warning that just said certain and then that would that would cover anything that had been previously listed but then of course then it makes us not focus as much on this uh, that's kind of that's, where my mind i'm kind of going yeah that make it number 12. That. If it's if it's twelve, then we'll kind of when you, your mind goes to the blanks right. with it being right next to the blank that you have to fill out versus yeah. a whole other paragraph, and then it really ties it into those particular notices. Right. Um, Does that mean we but it, add which is and these are under title yeah. notices? <laughs> exactly. Weird. Well, that's why because they are <coughs> they fall within the like, side. <coughs> that's the best place to be a title notice. So do you want to set up like no, I think required? Leave it in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there notices that aren't required? In the no, yeah, that is. But do you need to say certain required notices? I like it. You hear that about adding before notices required, certain required notices? That that adds yes. the emphasis on it. I told him to yeah. write that. <laughs> Since that's the name of the 11. No, I didn't even put those two together. That's, right. that's what got Simple. my attention. I'm so the question is, that's what we have on the table is, do we need to add statutory tax no, no, no. districts or to the list of notices here? And right, in which, let me see if I can 
It won't create another line in the contract as it is right now. If we had the room to, so to put that in. So hard to figure out how to do my, here we go. Did that do it? Sharing? I know. That's what's so cool about it. Hopefully it'll get their attention. I think yeah. I have to, un <coughs> sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a slow driver here. Next year we'll, we'll edit it. Well, you're no Ron Walker. I'm no <laughs> Ron Walker. I'm already thinking the same thing. Warning, warning, warning. Y'all are tough. It's a tough crowd, yeah. Really tough. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to share again. I'm going to get there just, I'm going to step by step her. Okay, so now we're still in section six. This is the title notices, section six E, and so three is the one that's specifically about the statutory tax districts. And then if we rolled on down, that's where we were already. Okay, so I'm up, I'm up here in the statutory tax district, which was part of the agenda item, which is why I'm. Which what other on it. notice? Is included in there that's not in the, the list already well the only thing about the list and what in the list I'm talking about is in number 11 required notices I don't know it does say for you, example, you have transfer fees for example gas. I mean we could I could say any of the above include it you know maybe we say above <coughs> For example, those listed above. That's a good idea. <coughs> or John's point or other notices or something. I don't know. Again, I'm just worried about the layman, the lazy agent who just goes to fill in the blank and they say, oh, I need to put mud, wicked, and pit. And that's all I need to put. Mm -hmm. I like your idea of referring to the items above. And there may still be others because there's FERPTA and there's other. Right. <laughs> so it's not really limited. So for lady, lady. Is good for everything. It's not really yeah, limited to the atoms above. That's mm -hmm. right. Above or elsewhere in this contract. And honestly, yes. I mean, if, or required by the world. If they're lazy to the extent <laughs> that we're talking about, the warning statement's not going to matter anyway. I think the warning is good. I think it, I'm not saying it isn't. I, I think it's mm -hmm. good. I, I, I really, I really think that that, for example, mud, WCID, PID, you know, I, I think it, I, you know, if you're if you're going to see it as an all inclusive list, you're just you're not paying attention, and there's not much we can do for you. Yeah, I mean, this is a 11 page contract, a 10 page contract. Well, let's we're not putting any language back to the commission today on this so we can between now and the next meeting we can look at other dis other possible notices to go in there and see what list we if we want to include anything else we just this is a new change new language that's out there we see how people you know if there, well we hear any evidence of people missing any notices or misconstruing it or what do you think mr chair about the idea of taking out the examples and just saying required notices we above talk, or elsewhere in this contract. We talked about that a lot the last meeting when we recommended the language of people not knowing what those notices are. And because there's, like, is the mud, how's the mud discussed? The bug, and that's one of the big ones. I don't know if it's actually. I, I can say, for example, notices described above. But, but we want to catch the ones that are elsewhere in the contract, too. Because all of those, I mean, I don't know. Each one, as you wrote in your warning, each notice has its own. For example, notices rules. described in this contract. I don't think, for my personal opinion, there giving a list that's clearly not all inclusive helps, and, and right. especially if going to the point of people don't read the contract, right? They go to the blanks. Give them some help on at least the big ticket items, and if it's a five percenter, then it doesn't need to be on that list. And, just like when we added solar panels and other things to, mm -hmm. you know, fixtures or whatever the, the list was there. Um, but yeah. maybe we expand, for example, mud, wicked, pid, notices. And other notices. And other notices above or elsewhere in this contract. I think that's the most efficient way. 
and, and other notices described in this contract. Well, it's no longer, for example. That's right. Yeah. Well, if you put a proper comma, that's where that officer comma comes in. <laughs> First, first mention yep. of the Oxford Cup. <laughs> Keep a tally. So, <laughs> but we don't have an hand there. Oh, we, we do now. If you'll wait a second for She's me to working. switch. She's Just working. hold on. I don't know how to use the team share tray very well, but I'm going to. Well, at least you can get your solution. So it's fun to be able to watch her screen. <laughs> yeah, sit by me if you want to. No. No. Ron's watching this live. Ron is aware. Totally. I think we should pass the motion. He's not allowed to miss any more meetings. That's. Uh, <laughs> I will second that one. I think this is the first time in my tenure that he's had to miss, and for good for, for good go. reason. So. All right. Here's what I added. I added this since you saw it last. Sure. After PID, I think you take out the word notices. Mud, Wicked, PID, and yes. other notices elsewhere. I agree. Could someone read it? You just hate having words in there twice. Sure. Church. <laughs> Require notices. The following notices have been given or are attached to this contract. For, in, for example, Mud, WCID, PID, and other notices elsewhere described in this contract. And that have a blank elsewhere, elsewhere described or described elsewhere. Yeah, I don't think we need four examples. We don't even need the word elsewhere. Well, Brian, <laughs> <laughs> if we, if we how about that? that words? How about that? Is that the article? No, no. Oh, that is. <laughs> that's that's the that's the because that's people that's don't understand the Oxford comma. No, I think, I think it comma. I think you had it right. I think so. I think so too. But again, we got some. People that didn't go to Oxford over here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you need to you need the word elsewhere. And other notices described in this contract. That's I would agree. That's, you don't need that's, that's a word. That's a walk. I'm sorry, could you say it right? again? They're taking out elsewhere. So it's in other notices described in this contract. Throughout this contract. In it's already days. in this contract. You don't need throughout. I inter, know. inter Alia. I know. <laughs> Trying to help the lay person. Okay, okay there you go. Don't know so what there's what I'm thinking. Throughout the contract? Are there any Those notices that are not described in the contract? Meaningful to the people she's talking about. That are required. You can't help all these people. What do you want? <laughs> no, I, I'm just posing the question. Are there any required notices that are not in the described in the contract? I don't think this? so, but I'm wrong already. Correct. If we're, trying, if we're trying to make it easier for people contract. by making it and longer. Then they're going to have to go. Oh, so it's required. Yeah. People, no, yeah. people, price, and property. I, like I mean, that. do we have to explain them some? It, it's a <clears throat> fact specific. It's property specific if it's required or not. I mean, I'm not required to disclose a, what was the big thing, a gas, a, a propane tank, but I'm not a propane tank. Either, well, I'd like applicable required notices. No, I, it's not required if you don't have it. Okay, so, and it's true. I like, I, and I, I really like the warning there. I think that was a good suggestion to put that in. I was more in line of education, but I think that really helps. I like this. I think it was very well crafted, and it's, it's pointing out without adding words to those individual paragraphs, reference to the water district and to the, uh, the pit. Which are the issues? So I think it's appropriate. Does anybody have any other changes or suggestions? Well, I do have one. I mean, since again, we're concerned about this tax district. I mean, those are, I'll, I'll save it. And don't forget, the legislature is working on this statutory tax district notices anyway, so it might also wind up on the right. seller's just It's a good good start. Yeah. Not, but... Okay. So Alert. how are we, so is this just a, are we, Consi we considered this language? Saying we're going to 
how do I need how well I, I, I we're not we're not putting it before the commission so how, how would we list this in the minutes I just said that we've discussed adding it but I don't I think how we typically <coughs> do it is that you would just say we uh, the committee suggested um, the following language uh, staff will uh, add to the contract form to review at the next meeting okay for the for the draft yeah okay <laughs> it's just for information, if I could ask a question, is there a reason we developed an uh, addendum for the public improvement district assessment, but there isn't a water district assessment, a uh, water district tax notice? It's fallen to the uh, trade associations. So is there a reason why, with co consequences that go along with it, that we didn't address that? The legislature required the bid. Well, we were told what we had to do with the bid form. Yeah. Okay, that definitely explains that. I mean, the, the water, water district does not require decades. track to do it. Yeah, Just I like that, um, whatever legislation we were looking at a minute ago, one of them said Trek will uh -huh. make a form. They figured out that we make a form. So. Yeah. They signed it. Water yeah. district forms have been out there, or the water district requirements have been out there longer. Fifty years, that and I they know. didn't. They didn't. Well, was this committee? I guess it was. Maybe it might have been before this committee existed, and that's well, certainly before they told us to make Is one. Is that an appropriate <coughs> thing to consider? Well, our historical um, position on the broker lawyer committee. And, and that the commission has backed up is we only promulgate statutorily required notices. Mm -hmm. So the seller's disclosure notice that Trek publishes is word for word from property code 5.008 and nothing more. Whereas the Texas Realtors has a much more extensive and it adds on other things that are handy to know. But we only stick with what we have been required to do and we're required to we're required or at least we've adopted that we're required to do the SDN for a long time and it actually says it doesn't say the track has to promulgate that form actually but and this is where Ron's brain would be very helpful on, yeah. on that side so uh we let's make note of that and we can see because that's often the question that I get as well and why don't we have yeah, that form yeah. there and, and the, 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 the three different versions of it and, yeah. and education yeah. but I think it's worth <laughs> investigating thank you okay so we'll move on to the next topic item is an update regarding using the appraisal addendum with USDA loans and so the the question here, I think the is right now the appraisal addendum is only for conventional loans, right? And the the reason it's not for FHA and VA is because you have to sign an inventory clause that says that the buyer has the right to get out if it doesn't appraise. The question came up on whether that same requirement is in USDA loans. And and staff did a, a check and did not find any requirement like that in there. But there's no there's no definitive answer that we have yet. So we don't have, can't say today that absolutely there's not that. And so we, I, we're kind of, it's one of those that does anybody feel strongly that we need to seriously consider adding that? Um, this is the 49, <coughs> uh, form 49. Well, did anybody just ask a I'm about to try to share well, Isn't it a government loan? USDA is a government loan. Yeah, but so it's it's certain statutes have it's the, it's the, the requirements of some don't, so. Yeah. It's like a, it's it's not, it doesn't work the same way as an FHA or a VA would. It's not the same kind of insured. It's like USDA is, it's a conventional line right. where they kind of like tagged on their program. Right. I don't think there is any kind of an mandatory clause. But the easiest thing to do is just ask a lender. I mean, I think any lender that does USDA loans could just answer the question for us. I will put that on my to-do list before the next meeting. So I, I just read something about this too. I'm trying just to remember where I read it. I, Robin, since you're here, has was that the subject of one of a, a Texas Realtors recent for USDA notices? loans specifically? Yes. No, not that I'm aware of. I I did just send a message to our 
are top line attorneys who get these questions all the time on USD loans. I haven't heard back, but. Wasn't it? I actually thought about that, but the one I was going to the about USDA loans, so. Is Ruffle talking about it? So, I don't know. Ruffle's the We'll see if we get an answer mid-meeting from the, the lender on that to help guide our discussion. But in, in the meantime, if not, I'll, I'll look that up. I just looked on USDA mm -hmm. FAQs and they don't have it. They don't have anything. So assuming they don't have anything, do we want to add that to the appraisal to this is the, the question? You know, we don't have cash, the cash appraisal to them right now. And do we feel there's a strong need or has there been a desire in the market to have it apply to US VA loans? And personally, I haven't heard any you know, demand for it out there. I don't, yeah, I, I just don't deal enough with USDA loans, you know. I think but once I we start to touch that, then you'd have people wanting something for FHA. Does the well, they and do want it. we'd be opening up a can of worms, probably. Well, they want it, but they're prohibited. They, they want it right now. Yeah. Is it, does, I, I can't remember at the top. Does it say just for conventional, or does it say not for use in FHA and VA loans? It says not just, just for FHA and VA. Right here. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, it, then it could be used. For that, it, oh, that, it is that doesn't already broken enough. That's right. That doesn't prohibit yeah, USDA. Broken. That's it's right. So it's almost a negative that the concern was. Do we need to also prohibit USDA? And it doesn't, and it doesn't like say that. Do at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. No, we don't. It's just open. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, right. smart. Yeah. Very good, very good point. <coughs> All right, number six, discussion and possible action regarding comments received on contract forms since the last meeting. So if you turn to your material starting on page three, and thank you, Amber, for the, uh, the new format. This made it much easier to, at least for me, to go through and read. And she spent quite a bit of time figuring out how to format this. And this is great. Doing that. So yeah, this yeah. really is great. When I saw this one, this is nice. Uh, yeah. So thank you very, very much for that. <laughs> so the first one from uh, Jody Warner uh, is wanting a list of legal holidays that apply to delivery of earnest money and option fees. And I think this is obviously something we don't wouldn't put in the contract as far as education goes. Um, I'm not sure if there's any list that Shrek well, has currently. As a matter of fact, a I did a little looking here. Uh -huh. um, the Texas government code defines what a national holiday is, okay. and that's the usual New Year's, MLK, President's Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas. And then it also defines a state holiday, which includes Confederate Heroes Day, Texas Independence Day, San Jacinto Day. And you say, is that a legal holiday? Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, they define in the government code what a legal holiday is. And it says a legal holiday is all of the national holidays and the first six state holidays that are listed. And those are Confederate Heroes Day, Independ Texas Independence Day, San Jacinto Day, Emancipation Day, LBJ Day, yes. now that's important, and the Friday after Thanksgiving Day. So it I would say the term legal holiday it's a legal holiday includes only the following. And so I've changed that. I've seen a whole bunch of different contracts. In, in the commercial context, uh, you often see that they reference days that banks are closed. National banks are closed. Or title companies. <laughs> well, they vary. The title companies will vary. But if you if you tag it to the day that national banks are closed, and I'd, I'd also add the Friday after Thanksgiving, because most of us recognize it, but banks have to be open. On the Friday after Thanksgiving, when, but I think I I've always worried that somebody says the seller says you didn't get the option fee to me in time, and they say, oh, didn't you know that that was Confederate heroes? <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, and or LB, I mean, that's true. LBJ. I don't know what, <laughs> what day that is. 
Yeah, some some years ago when this issue came up, before some people may remember that I presented a whole you know list of these holidays awesome. to the committee. I made a whole little presentation. I said you know maybe we should restrict it to just the that list of federal holidays and then the, the A part list of the Texas statutory holidays, which is similar. And you know, but uh, the committee knocked it down, and Ron Walker was sort of the key opponent. He's just mm -hmm. kind of like, well, it's on the TAR forms, it's legal holiday, and it doesn't cause that much trouble. So the, that, that whole issue got uh, kind of tabled. I was like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> but I put it in my book. So I've got a whole list of everything there so you, you know what's going on. But, you know, so that's uh, that's what happened the last time. Uh, <laughs> I think you were a supporter of putting something in, too. That's I'm great. against putting things in. I was on the Ron Walker train and, and congealing my thoughts on it. It is location specific to where the property is because some locales have their own holidays as well yeah you know, like houston had a legal holiday when the astros won that became a holiday that's not an annual holiday there there may be other i, I think this has been in there this is way below five percent you know this is this has come up i think every year yeah. What what's the alternative language? Just to talk out what it would be. What what would you list? That was that was just the, pretty much what he was talking about. It's the national holidays and then maybe the A part of the Texas statute. But here's one other problem you have, and and I'm I'm so glad you raised that issue because what do you do about things <laughs> like uh, you have Jewish holidays, you have Muslim holidays. If you're going to do this on legal, Ramadan, legal holidays. if you're going to do this on Ramadan, that could be a very significant issue for somebody who's. Well, I think, you know, I think or, you have the full statute. Yeah, yeah. uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Good Friday are optional holidays. They yeah, don't but, fall under so the So I think you would have to do like, a, like yeah, we do the C the code. You do like C those statutes. Housing. <laughs> I, I think it's <laughs> Muslims. That's education to, in my yeah. mind, and in, in making the adding that to the contract, that'd be a few lines of additional language, so and they will be changing up the rights so that, so that they are right now. I just want. I just want to be clear. Are we in agreement that if the last day happens to be Confederate <laughs> Heroes Day, buyers have until the next day? No, really. It's a legal no, holiday. It's a legal holiday. holiday. It's a legal holiday anymore. It's not recognized. It's it's not not recognized. It's yes, not it is. It is if it's a not legal holiday. If it's in the what government code, code to? we argue that at the courthouse. If it's still alive, SJ, if that's in the government code, I say it. that's a holiday. Your Honor, see statute, see statute yeah, number two. But it's not a legal holiday. Banks are open, courts so are open. I'm going to call 5% on yes. this challenge. And then also, whenever you're ready, I have the USDA. Okay, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, let's jump back to that here. The USDA. The USDA yeah. So um, I texted the lender, a, a good one that does a lot of USDA stuff. Oh, and she said cool. that not only is there not an amendatory clause, that there is no prohibition in the USA, USDA guidelines, and it's very common, or in past market, it has been very common for buyers on a USDA loan to pay over appraised value, because USDA is zero down, right? So money they have saved that would have went to down payment, they just go to USDA and pay over the appraised in order to get the house. It's just a change. And the, and the lenders... She, she she also made a comment that most lenders have a form that they make them sign saying they're aware that they're paying more than a price value, but there's no there's no prohibition. So our forms are good as drafted. I think so. Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, it's good to get closure on on that one. Thank you. Thank you. you can take that off your to do list. Yes. That's a chat man. You're helping me out here. What is that? All right. So back to the legal holiday. Um, I, I do agree myself that it's a, a five percent rule. I, I also agree that the statute would control the legal fight. If we're arguing about this in court, I agree with Tony that the judge will take that as being instructed. And I think that's where we ended up last time was how will a court look at this? And, and if we wanted to change the actual rights up of the parties, then we had to write that in. Um, but right now, as the government code stands, it's those those national holidays and the six that are that are listed. Anybody else have a real strong feeling beyond the five percent rule? No. And I do think I do I think, think it's sure. locational. Yeah. Okay. So then we'll go to the next comment from Brett Wilkinson. 
who wants to change to 15 day um, period. Actually, what about? John, oh, wait, wait. Oh, no, sorry. Though, Case all. Sorry. If we don't go on amended yep. one, it's, oh. that's what I've got here. Amended? Well, oh, I, I skipped ahead. So, Colin yeah, Newberry. Check, yep. check so, it's concerned, and this is a concern that is raised yep. quite often. It's about paragraph, um, the, the paragraph 17 about the attorney's fees. It does not specifically list the agents in there. It's right. drafted as a buyer, seller, listing broker, other broker, or escrow agent. And I did not see the case, the uh, CB case out of Houston. I thought it was the one in our materials, but that's a new one out of Dallas. Um, but this has been raised multiple times in my practice. And <coughs> I haven't had a case that had to go all the way through to see how the court would rule. But, but Trella specifically says that a broker is liable for all acts of their agent, period, the end. You know, so first of all, an agent is never a proper party to litigation that involves a transaction. And if an agent filed it, it should be dismissed because they have no standing. It is the broker. And if an agent is sued, they should answer that they're the improper party and that the broker is the proper party and the court should rule on that. And, you know, when, when agents, just as a point of information, and I get about 50 of these a year, when an agent calls me when we in about something that happened in the transaction, I say, go talk to your broker, you know, because the broker is the one who owns this claim for commission or whatever the issue is. Thank you. Yeah. All the, all That's the, the law. <clears throat> we can't change that. And so I'm sorry. The very jargon of the name, agent, you're the agent, education. you're the associate of the broker. That's yeah. right. Yeah. They cannot the act alone. I, I agree with that. I think, though, this is a situation where somebody went after the listing agent and they said it was frivolous and they wanted to get their attorneys. Again, they, so, so they this didn't would be handle like their litigation properly. The broker should it's the pursue. broker. Yeah. The broker, first of all, the agent is not a proper party. And the agent should have answered, I'm not a proper party. Okay, so if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm the listing agent and the buyer says, you, listing agent, made yeah. a fraudulent yes. representation to me you're and an sue you broker. individually for misrepresentation. You answer that you're an improper party and they bring in the broker. It's, it's always happened 500 times. times. Oh, it's it's yeah. We have to sue the broker. Listing. You have I mean, to sue will the broker. Will you command the broker's attorney? I have a broker's license. Advising you too. Well, any... I sue the agent also because they're often contractual or 1099. But you can't have to take You can get an anti-slap on that now. Too, because I mean it's statutory. They're not a proper party, and and people do see the agent to put pressure on them because it has their personal name out there in the record, and da 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 da. But that's a 91A now, which is the anti slap That is absolutely improper if we were, you know, whatever it is, well, but if we were in federal court, it is not a proper cause. There is no proper cause of action against an agent in their ability. Have you had one of those granted? Oh, I've had 500 of them granted. I want copies. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I was. You know, my yeah, first seven years, I did yeah. insurance yeah. defense for, for brokers and other professionals, and that happened all the time. And that's one of the first things I would do is get the agent out of the case yeah. individually. And I haven't had one where they only sued the agent. You know, they've always yeah, they had, the had both. But yeah. they, and so if, if that's the, I agree that we don't need to stop it. <laughs> I, I, I sue both. I, I sue but both. But it's improper. But both, you're, the, you're the smart one because at 30 or 40 a year, you're like a decade. No, no one's done well. In a couple of meetings ago, when we discussed it, there are the attorneys out there trying to get tricky and only sue the yeah. agents to avoid the potential of having the I attorneys. Want the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. And they're trying to get and tricky and then get yes. a lawyer on the other side that doesn't know the, the, the procedure. It's they the one who's responsible. Yeah. No, yeah, that's, that's the one who's yeah. responsible. So that was a, that sounds like a problem back for this agent exactly and it, agent. you know, right. it should have been handled differently. But, so, right. Ian, I would say that's in, in the, just to jump on that topic in our meat materials, we have that new case that's out there about attorney's fees. Yeah. It's, um, it's also a, a CD case. It, but in that case, they upheld the award of attorney's fees to both the broker and the yes. agent. Um, and followed the law, essentially. And followed the law. And I'll, I'll wait to, that's agenda item A. I'll wait to actually 
paraphrase that to later, but that that actually is a case where they, they were awarded and upheld for both parties. So and ironically, is that the worthy case? It's it's on page let's see, nine. About the Maskell, let's see, yeah, about Brian, Laura yeah. Maskell. But going back on the on page nine, which is also is agenda item seven. Ironically, they had sued the two uh, agents in here. Oh, that one. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know if they actually lasted, you know, all the way through the case. You know, the style probably didn't. Well, this was the appellant, so they were. There probably was a joint and several award. Those, those are the two agents, Tibbetts and Bird, of signature, and the court didn't talk about it, but it, they should have been dismissed. Anyway, that was a that was the MSJ, so it didn't have much. Well, we'll move on right, right. from that one. Okay. Okay. So now to Brett Wilkinson, who has a couple comments. First, he wants the uh, 18C paragraph 18C, which is the earnest money demand, right? That you can make if there's a, a dispute. Once it changed to a 15-day period, uh, it thinks or thinks it's unfair. Right. He wants essentially for us to step in to handle and settle earnest money disputes. And this is one of the most frustrating areas for anybody practicing, right? If you have a few thousand dollars sending in earnest money, are you going to hire a lawyer to go fight it? And is there any way to do it any better than we have now? Which um, how we have, what we have now is the if the buyer wants the earnest money back, he send a demand or seller. They can send a demand to the other party in the title company. If they only send it to the title company, the title company forwards it on. And there's no objection, then the title company is released from liability by releasing the earnest money to the party that demanded it. It protects the title company. But it's a may, they're not required. Right. And, and different title <clears throat> companies handle it different ways. But I don't know if there's any other way we can we can do this. I mean, we can't handle and settle their disputes. Well, I, mean, um, I like think all he's saying he thinks here, 15 to be short. Yeah, I think he's yeah. just saying that 15 <laughs> days is, is too long. And I will say, I think the 15 day rule has been there. Well, I know it's been there since 96 because it's been there the whole time I've been licensed, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And there was a time when it made sense to be 15 days because That's the only option <laughs> was snail, snail, snail mail, mail yeah. right? You know, so maybe or maybe not. The 15 days could be a shorter period of time. I mean, think about we give them how many days do we give them to object to, you know, title issues? I mean, if they can do all those other things more quickly, why can they not decide if they're objecting to the release? Because this is just it's, it's just I, I them to decide guy. if they're going to object and turn in a formal objection. And that really doesn't take 15 it's really, days it's not like maybe it did at one time. So, My only concern is we're dealing with with laymen, non-legal minds, both from the most of the time with the agent and the, the principals of getting to somebody. Right. They're not going to know right away. I, and if they go talk to a lawyer, maybe they can't get in and see that lawyer right away. And, and having that 15 days to me is not an eternity. And it gives them that breathing room to, to find legal help. I mean, you know, it's an adequate rate. 10 yeah, days, I think 15 that's a, exactly. days. Exactly. I mean, that's 10 legit. days wouldn't offend me, you know, whatever you put in. But in three, and you're speaking three, as, three, as a title company. As yeah, a title, I mean, title like it's shorter I, in my personal opinion. I don't, I don't really care. My experience with 18C has been this really only applies in situations where the one side has gone dark. Like you have a, a contract, the sell, seller's ready, the buyer disappears. changes their mind, they disappear, whatever. And this is an easy tool. To get. If there's any sniff of a dispute, no title company is going to release the earnest money. Well, I think, I mean, John made a point that satisfied me, and that was if they want to talk to an attorney. I don't, I don't want to discourage that, so yeah. give them time. And that's the only really instance I've ever seen it. From, from my title perspective, it's when somebody went dark yeah. and, and every other time it's been responded to. I've okay. just never said you should talk to an attorney and they actually listen to me. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 I do sometimes. Occasionally. Uh, a few and far between. Well, well it, it's a good good thought. Um, and I may have read somewhere else. There, the, the argument over settling earnings money disputes has been a long frustration for many, many people. It may not be um, a 5%. But it might be a 6%. But I would say if we're going to think about shortening it based on, as Lee mentioned, this has been 
around for a long time and things do move much faster. I'm not against that, but I do think we ought to at least um, maybe talk to TLTA people or make sure in the insurance code, I don't have a title company, yeah, that there's not some requirement. We don't want to step there's on, not. I mean, it yeah. is. There's not. Okay. Not, not really. No, well, aren't the okay. title companies sending out some sort of a letter to, to sell you know, us? I mean, the, well? yep. and I will tell you, if, if anything, I mean, 18, 18, 18C is frequently mm -hmm. misunderstood. Yes. And, and people don't follow the procedures. I mean, it's a multi-step process. First, somebody has to send a release of earnest money, okay? And it could be one of the parties or the escrow agent. And then if either party fails to execute the release, then you make the written demand. And of course, it doesn't say, doesn't give a time frame there. And then if only one party makes it a written demand, then the title company sends the demand. And then and only then does the 15 day start. And, and I've seen great misunderstanding of what 18C is in the process. I could see rewriting C to make it blocked with so that you can see that there are multiple steps. And I think that would be easier to understand. It wouldn't be a bad project to rewrite 18C so that people understand it. But it, I mean, it works the way it is. I like your comment. If there's any SNP, we don't do anything. Because that's what agents have to understand. I just want, you know, because people read this as they're counting their 15 days and they're like. Yeah, I, I, I sent you the demand, you know. Yeah. yeah. And the 15 days, no, it starts when the title company sends. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and, yeah, years ago, kind of an amusing thing, the, the issue was debated, and, and the very important word may was stuck in there. And that was a Rick Melamed contribution, because what happened is the TLTA sent a bunch of you know, representatives up. They appeared with bow ties and so forth that made a very presentation. There could be a divorce, there could be bankruptcy, there could be this, there could be that. And therefore, we cannot guarantee that we can you know, disperse the earnest money. And so, uh, finally, uh, uh, I think Walter Borfeld said, well, if we change must to may, would that satisfy your problem? And they thought about it a minute, they said, yes. And that was the end of about a 10 minute discussion. And, and Rick Melamed says, you handled it, Walter. <laughs> and so you yeah. see may just throughout the paragraph of the day. <laughs> so we'll defer thought on that to maybe rewriting that to a future meeting. Just leave it as it is. So it's got may, uh, got it. Brett's second comment is about property approval and think three days before closing doesn't make sense in that it should be at least 10 days. Mm. Uh, Boy, there's kicking and screaming when we went with three. Yeah, I thought so too. Yeah, 10 really, John. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a lot and so, uh, and I actually have a discussion point between Ron and I had on uh, the three day calculation, which we'll get to in the next bullet point. But does anybody feel strongly? Lily. Lily. All right. Lily Rockwell has a question. Do you list money coming from the sale of other property and special provisions? Basically, she's concerned that we're basically pushing people to use um, special provisions. I think she's the one that lists that. Okay. Yes. And this is a classic example of what an informational <laughs> item is. I am this going to get. Yep. No, no. This is a classic example of somebody not understanding that the promulgated language if it is in the promulgated language it is not to be changed and put into special provisions and the promulgated language says sales price cash portion of the sales price is blah 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 the term cash portion does not include proceeds proceeds from borrowing any kind or selling other real property, except as except disclosed, as in, this disclosed in this contract. So sorry, but we have the form. You have to use the form. If you don't use the form, then you are. Well, she. What she's saying though is, if you don't have the sale of other property addendum, no, you don't have I, to. You don't have to use that. And no, so then you, you need have to, to use that. No, you don't. No, no. no that's only if you want to use the termination option. It's not subject to yeah, the sale. We've defined knockout. it as this. We have defined cash as does not no, no. include from. Except as disclosed in this contract. And you, as as an, disclosed and in this you contract. could put in paragraph 11, 
I am using proceeds from the sale of my property to buy this property. And that's the absolute I proper see. thing. And that is the that. informational yeah. item. <laughs> that's exactly what that's meant for. That, that blank. But does that infer a contingency? <laughs> no. 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 And that's why you list it there instead of using the, the addendum. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't want this to be contingent. Here, and what, what our big thrust was, and including that language, is we want sellers to make an informed decision on the offer that came in. Yes. Especially in the old crazy market, people had to sell to their houses, had to get old loans from yeah, the good old days. I'm retracting my comment. Um, Sorry. And so oh, that's this. And I, I don't know of any other better way to do it, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And, and that goes with the change we made for informational items and defining their yeah. yeah. I definitely do want it to be disclosed because that is a major yes. thing. And if I'm the buyer, excuse me, if I'm the seller, I'm probably saying. Yeah, and her concern really is us is pushing them to use special provisions, but mm -hmm. that's exactly, I think, what special provisions is, is there for. Really. If we didn't want them to use it ever at all, we would take it out of the contract. That's been tried. <laughs> I mean, I mean I we're going to be down to one inch. As, a, as an agent and a broker, I want that special provisions, at least those two lines. <laughs> I think we're going to get to the one line. You get. So, what about the buy now, sell later, so or buy first, sell later portion? I mean, her, her, this is for like the homeward companies that, out there. That, Again, is not gonna. It's not gonna fit under the third-party financing addendum. It, it would be an informational item. Right. If you just yeah. put special provisions, homeward. I mean, they know it's homeward because the well, seller's homeward. I mean, it doesn't matter when they do the contract. No, no. The this, this, they're homeward. talking about where where they're providing the bridge loan. Yeah. Those guys. I know, but if the seller's homeward, the seller won't, gonna... won't be home homeward. Homeward is working with the buyer in providing well, I mean, them. Okay, the buyer is homeward. You're, the buyer is homeward. I've done homeward contract. They, it's homeward. Yeah, they assign the contract. And right. then they assign it later. It has nothing to do with this contract. Yeah. It, it, to the extent homeward wasn't the buyer, then special provisions again is you the could place say, to yes. that. I mean, that's right. But, you know, let's just make a note here since we're having a meeting. This is. We are not actually giving guidance. The broker lawyer committee does not actually give guidance. We may give information to track, to suggest, to put in the legal updates and so forth into training, but we are not giving yes, guidance on how to practice real estate. Right? Correct. Although if somebody paid attention to this Call recording, Texas. they could. It's all education. Along. Right. Same comment. This is education. That's a. Yeah, Tracy Smith saying deals with adjustment. Who pays? She doesn't understand the last sentence of the proration paragraph. Yep. And so her concern is that There's she no thinks the two the last two sentences of the proration paragraphs conflict with each other. But they I think that's just a misunderstanding of the, the language itself. We can move past that one. Francis Venable. Um, one section of the amendment dealing with additional option money in state is paid to the title company. No. Mm -hmm. we, we've gone over this one. I think that again, the, the confusion that the, when you sign the amendment, that is receipt of bonus yes. money. It's the job that you're right. right. It has, oh, has been paid. We've, we've discussed this at, at nauseum before. Yeah. So you just have to pay attention and bring it up to the the what are we calling them now? Agency, the title agency. When you are yeah, looking at your closing disclosures, closing yeah. statement, whatever you call it. it's not the one anymore. Look at that and make sure that that yeah. credit's on there. Yeah. Yeah. Give me that ten dollars. So Carly Thomas, let's see, a new home. Once she does not like. Let's see. Oh yeah, this is a multiple. Does not like that the seller has a lot of information yeah. to fill in. Um, my opinion, this should be in the form of a pre-listing disclosure. Could be great. Um, mm -hmm. But hold on. Still needs to be. A Wait a second. Is this a buyer agent? Wait a second. Our chair has some thoughts on this. I know. Uh -oh. I'm just trying to get to there. Ignore me. Can oh. I? Maybe I'll stop unsharing my ideas. 
can I? Oh, there's Scott. I just hey, know that Mr. Kesner joined us. <laughs> He's ignoring us. Well, <laughs> oh, you know what? Oh, no. nope, Scott, that's, better. You. that's better. That's <laughs> better. <laughs> I don't know. Is that better? That's better. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I, I know Chelsea's in there. I know uh, Vanessa. A lot of people are at the winter meetings. We got a lot of comments on this. And, you know, of all the changes you made, I loved this as a broker on those four contracts. We have a seller that just signs that contract. He does not read that he has no knowledge. And if everything, if anybody ever comes back, he's going to say, well, they didn't explain that to me. So I love the fact that they have to make an affirmative acknowledgement. They don't know any of this or none of this is present, almost like the commercial contract. Uh, and then one person came up with a, with, a, with a statement that I'm not supposed to touch the seller disclosure. And this says seller disclosure. So I wonder in the, in the future, if we just make this material information or something like that and not call it a true seller disclosure, or if we get rid of the check boxes, do we at least bullet it down like the commercial contract where it's just not one paragraph nobody reads? I love that, that they have to affirm they don't know this. But th those are the comments we got. I like the change, but maybe the seller disclosure scares everybody. Well, it, it might take to, to piggyback off that is I like the process as it's out there now. And, and as we drafted it, because the buyer, I think, education wise, can check no on everything. Right. And what we wanted is that people actually pick up on this for years and years. Nobody knew this was actually in the contract because a lot don't read it. And so if the, the offer goes over and has no, the seller then has to check yes. It has to be sent back. And that's what we want. We want that discussion and that disclosure from the seller to the buyer before the buyer's under contract. And it's not. It's a simple initial on the change, right? And so it forces that discussion. And yes, is, is it log a logistical issue? Yeah, it's a few more back and forth, but that's the discussion we want to facilitate to begin with. Or, or. So I would say, um, I too like the way it is. I mean, just the fact that we're getting comments tells us that we're on the right track. We've, we've accomplished at least a portion of the purpose. Um, I also have <coughs> had comments about this, the whole seller's disclosure thing. And I don't, I don't think that's a bad idea. Scott mentioned about just changing the title instead of saying seller's disclosure. If there's a way to say owner's disclosure or this, material this fact, is or statutory though. This, this was a this okay. Is statutory. Well, then we can't change it. Well, the, no, these no, are no, we're talking about H. Yeah. In, in the so the flooding is but the reason we yeah, put I'm these not talking in about here changing is because the questions. I'm just talking about changing the title on yeah, where it says age seller's it's disclosure to say disclosure. Right. And the, or, the reason why they're not they're in the four forms, right? The farm and ranch, the vacant land, and the two new homes. Because a lot of those transactions don't fall under 5008. Right. They're exceptions. And so in in long ago, at least for the first five or six, depending on the contract, we decided to put those in there. And to, because there were material items we thought were a big enough deal that people needed to know about. And then recently we just expanded with two additional ones on those contracts. And it's it, so it, we thought it's important enough to put in there. And it, to me, it is a seller's disclosure, right? And, and if we yeah. playing word, a, a word game may help, but I think ultimately it's education, right? On, on that yeah, part. I agree. But, but we've got agents that their brokers are saying, you do not touch the seller's disclosure. Right. And so when they see those words in the contract, they have a concern about completing anything that's a seller's disclosure. And I get that there's a difference and it's not, I mean, I get it. But for those people to make them more comfortable doing their job, if we could change that title, I don't think it's a bad idea. And it doesn't necessarily mean a back and forth and a bunch of initials, like you said, because the good agents are going to be getting the answers to those questions in writing from their seller at the listing appointment because they know it's in the contract. So, and so the language that was there before is just, I believe, disclosures. 
And we added, I think, did we add? Well, we it? added the check mark. The check mark is what we form. did that was so good. What the time? Yeah. Yeah. I'm only talking it's, about changing the kind of involved in that early thing that unless otherwise disclosed was the key thing at the beginning. Then all the rest were just, you know, listed and no checkbox. But the checkbox does make you think about it, and that's the advantage of the checkbox. So that's why uh, originally there was a subcommittee that didn't change it, and then more recently, finally we got the checkbox system, and that right. does seem to. In, it was the debate whether to do it as an addendum or in the contract, and we decided to yeah, leave it in the contract. It and, but but what if what if like H title. instead of saying seller's disclosure, say seller provides the following information. <laughs> That's even no. seller is aware, is not aware. So he is or is not no. aware. No. Then, then buyer's agents like we can't. I think that would just magnet magnify the issue almost with the buyers and saying I can't fill that in. Heaven so forbid they talk before they <laughs> submit an offer. So. So the seller's agents to send back to the and, buyer's agents. Uh, Scott, what was your suggestion in, in, in for language to change the title? I thought just make it material information. That way, I mean, it's not a disclosure. People aren't going to freak out about a disclosure, but the seller is still given material information. You know, whether as or not, you still have to disclose material information. And that to me just cleaned it up. That way, they're not doing a disclosure. But what concerns me, and I'm actually looking at the code trying to make sure my concern is legit, some of these are actual statutory yeah. disclosures. So yeah, I don't want to unemphasize that. But you know, and, and we don't want to promulgate a step. I mean, do but we, we already have a form, though. So we already have a the seller's disclosure form for right. the required disclosures and material but, but there's strong. an there's an exemption mm -hmm. for the seller's disclosure which is why they're in here so they're not statutory disclosures anymore as, but as, they are for certain properties what is the actual problem they're trying to solve somebody whining about uh having to come back and forth why it's not, well, there's that's not yeah. 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 i don't think that's what we're trying to solve at all i, I think, think we're past that one Right. Well, yeah, well, I think all we're trying to solve is these agents who have been taught that they cannot fill out a seller's disclosure. And take, now in the contract. I'm with you, but take that a step further. So are agents actually, what's the problem? I get that, but what is the problem? Because it's well, embedded well, in the contract. I'm I'm about it. I know they're complaining about it. I get it. But what is the problem? Other None. Than they're complaining. They do, they're leaving it blank. Okay, all so they these are people, leaving it blank. That's what well, well, they're, 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 over the they're, they're leaving it blank. That's a blank. Yeah. Rick found a personal question. This specific comment, in fact, he's an expert. This specific comment is that going back and forth for addition. Right. That, that is his particular problem, right? But if they filled it in, <laughs> I know him. He's actually don't. my agent. He can fix that himself. Right. I mean, that's not. So what they should do is say, no, 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 no. If you've got the buyer, say no, 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 and send it over. And frankly, yeah. if you have the seller, if you have listed the property and it's in one of these, you know, if it's got a disclosable issue, why wouldn't you just go ahead and put that on the listing so people know? I mean, it's not required, but it seems logical. I'm not the one who's worried about going back and forth. No, I don't. don't. Quit being looking no, at me. But we no, want them to have the discussion. We want them to have the discussion. Is it an educational problem that buyer agents are leaving it? <laughs> well, but even if they are, even if they are filling it in, there may be some back and forth because nobody. Absolutely. Well, because the buyer doesn't know, and we well, want them to have it. Well, I think, exactly. I think we're all comfortable with the back and forth of, of requiring that. I, I don't think anybody here is pushing to change that. I think what we're focused on in the issue on the table is, do we want to change the title to assist practice holders in no. this decades-long thing of never having your e sellers disclosed? This is fine. And I, I my comment would be, obviously, this is new, and everybody's getting used to it, and I think that as people become more <coughs> and we're educating more about it. I mean, I expected that we would get some pushback on this and that it's all a good discussion, but to me, we just changed it and we just put it in there. I don't see any need to change anything. 
I think we let everybody kind of work through bumps in the road and, and see how things go, and then we could and then address it at a later date if it continues to be a problem. That's a, I think that's a wise yeah. word. <clears throat> it's kind of not like the uh, lead based paint addendum. There are boxes in there that mm -hmm. a buyer preparing an exactly. offer for a seller is going to leave those blank unless the listing agent has uploaded the form into the MLS with the answers, mm -hmm. which is what some uh, agents have said that they're likely going to do, provide the information on the MLS so the buyer's agent knows how to complete the contract. And it's probably coincidental, and it's probably good to say that agents are concerned because they know they're not supposed to do the seller's disclosure, and it's just a coincidence that the word was used, seller's disclosure. But to escalate a point, you've got statutory disclosures there. So it probably is indeed why the word disclosure was added. It's, it's not so, a coincidence. It was intentional. Well, I'm sure it was. Yeah. And so it's in there as it should be. And now it's just going to be a matter of getting used to it. Offers go back and forth. And it's just going to be something in these particular contracts we're going to have to get yeah. used to. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Correct me if I'm wrong. We didn't change the title. We just added the check boxes in number well, seven. Eight. Disclosure. Yeah. It's I been this way for a while. Yeah, I looked that up and it got sellers. The only thing we changed, the only thing we changed was using disclosure singular instead of disclosure plural. Oh, that's why it crossed And adding boxes. We had it before there was the thing. We're talking about the title. We were talking about the title. Yeah. The title. Okay. The question was, did we use the word disclosure before? And the mm -hmm. answer is yes. Yeah, no. farm and ranch. I'm kind of happy that some agents seem to have paid some level of attention. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're making a mistake, but at least they. they I, have, I find joy. Yeah. I find joy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, I, and the question <laughs> has been in the training, you know, yeah. it is coming back that they have to talk to each other yeah. because they have yeah. to get these answers. And I don't, I think right now in our market, no one's really concerned. But the question I got from some of the students and stuff is if I don't fill this out properly the first time, you know, and it has to go back, I might lose the offer. And that's what you've been there. Huh? Yeah. Call but advance, if they don't, it? yeah, yeah, but it's I mean, communication. Yeah. And I don't know how. Pick up the telephone. We've got a contract okay. coming. I need to fill this in. Well, I, I, I agree. It'd be great to let this ride out a little bit more and see see if this continues. But and, and, and <laughs> the big education push with this. And I just love this from when we first had the subcommittee on this. And I was on that, that subcommittee and wanting this to be called out in some way. And I'm glad it's having the reaction that we wanted it to have. Um, in general, and we have a comment from Terry Rizzo in our supplemental materials that falls in here. The same thing about logistics going back and forth. Um, then we have Kathy Faulkner, who's also concerned about the logistics of seller's disclosure. Um, next one, same thing with Kelly. Um, wants a seller's disclosures in the addendum, an addendum, not in the contract. Brenda Cole, which I believe she's on the risk reduction committee, um, that same thing that they teach our agents not to touch seller's disclosure with their pens, um, and it's things we're setting everybody up for lawsuits. Scott Nolan, how does a buyer's agent offer present? Or same thing about having to fill out the section. Uh, Charles, Charles. Um, yeah. got a comment here. So we, uh, I'll let you take this one if, if you would like. Yeah. I talked to Dana Wilson at the Collin County Appraisal District. Uh, the moment he pulled out the 1990 Ag Manual, I kind of said, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, 32 years later, we have a new agriculture value and for the conference updates every year. Uh, and Blake and I have summed it up. We don't think we need to change. We would not recommend changing anything in the proration paragraph now. I went up and Blake and I met again in Clarksville, Texas, below uh, Paris the other day. I taught some classes for him up there and we both agreed the same thing. So. And the issue here was about a change in use of the property and whether it, it there were supplemental market adjustments that would be done in addition to the five-year <clears throat> rollback tax. Right. And the guidance here said in the, the case law says, no, no, you can't do that. Sure. And so you can only do the preceding five years and not the year that the change is actually made. So, okay. all right. Thank you, Charles. Mm -hmm. Not the not the year that the change is made. Correct. Is it which is an interesting result, but it's a result of the statutory language, right? And in, in Texas has a thing where it's construed in, or in favor of the the 
the taxpayer, not not the government. So if they if they rewrite the law, then <laughs> that's one thing. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, yeah. You can imagine that. that Actually, works. They're not in favor of the taxpayer, but they can screw things. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Just a, a quick point of clarification going back to Tom's this comment on paragraph 13, prorations, that the last line uh, was uh, unclear. Mm -hmm. If taxes are not paid at or prior to closing, buyers shall pay taxes for the current year. Mm -hmm. So I, I called uh, Texas Realtors Legal Hotline because as I looked at that, I wanted just to find out how that would be explained. Which is Robin said. And I didn't get Robin, and I won't disclose who I talked to. And the, it would have been wonderful. It was a little confusing because the question then would be, and I just want to see how you all would respond to that, <clears throat> is if if the seller had not paid the taxes, say it was going to close in February, and taxes were due at the end of January, and the taxes hadn't been paid, needless to say, the title company is going to take pro care mm -hmm. for the prior year. Chances are it's not yeah. going to close taxes for the prior right. year. So if taxes are not paid at or prior to closing, buyers shall pay taxes for the current year. So who pays January and February? They're going to close in February. Well, it normally would be the seller. But the taxes yeah. haven't been paid by the seller. So now it's saying the buyer is going to be paid. That's okay. the prior year. No, that's the prior not a year is going to be paid out. And then the yeah. proration for the current year. As they would normally yeah, you pay yeah. your prior. The it's going to come out of up to the date through the date. Of course, mm -hmm. unless they negotiated something different. I correct. And if yeah. so, so it didn't collect, that still says that they're paying for the current year. So they would pay from January 1. They wouldn't yeah. pay for the year prior. Re rem remember yeah. that taxes are due when the bill goes out, which is typically October, October. 1st. Okay. Mm -hmm. So from October 1st to the end of the year, those taxes are due. The title company is going to collect them. Okay, they become delinquent if not paid by February one of the next year. So, for, so for example, let's say it's it's January twenty seventh today, and I'm closing the deal. As the title company, I'm going to ensure that twenty twenty two taxes have been paid. Mm -hmm. The exception in the policy will be we accept the twenty twenty three taxes. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, yeah. and we will pay the twenty twenty two taxes. That is not being prorated. The seller is responsible for all of it. So that's a different issue than so. The proration is only for the current year. So if we have the them. buyer and seller using the contract, no attorneys, no real estate agents, and they don't use the title company. Well, then they shouldn't be using our contract God because the contract you. requires a title company. So there's that. Where does it require? Where does the contract require a title company? Says there will be a it says we can have one, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Well, it, you can get it without a title policy. Yeah, you can buy property without a title policy. It's not smart. Or, but yeah, you can. I mean, <laughs> we all think it's a horrible idea. But you can buy property without a title policy or even an abstract. Right. I, I know well, you, you can, can but our requirement, our contract it? requirement. I've already yeah. litigated this on the judge Lyman and Harris. So it shall be. You don't have to close a title company on your own right. contract. You have to have a title I know that. <laughs> gotcha. or I think I know so, that. So <laughs> what's the wording of the title company? That's good. Can you use my the one question I have on proration, and this isn't in the contract, but I don't know how we can. I think you have more. They're paying to it. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. How we can educate is in our area, I have a lot of disabled veterans mm -hmm. and the prorations are not being handled correctly at the title company I mean, and so the then the buyers there getting an extra policy. bill at the end of the year thinking because that they the seller is moving their exemption to the right right I know. and i don't know mm -hmm. how we can get around that but it's it's been a little large where we are you know, well, and if somebody's true. actually doing that and not closing the title company, the odds are something's going to screw up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, idea. Hold yeah. on. And Scott, I'd like you to weigh in here again. It is the policy of the Texas Real Estate Commission, and it's in our and problem. In our problem. The, 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 you know, they, there will be a title policy. It's who's going to pay for it. There will be an escrow agent. 
Da 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 da. I mean, I'm, I'm a, the title company. I'm a, I am not agreeing with whoever said you do not have to close at a title company mm -hmm. using this that. form. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so, not correct. I, I said it too, but I said it too. But that's I, not I correct. Talk. Well, one way or the other, it happens all the time. It, we, it we, may we, can, we can just disagree, but no one's here going to decide who's right. No, even if you no. say you're right. No one's going to say it's right. My so question, again, just confirmation <laughs> here. I mean, I know the answer, but it is Trek's position that that's, that's why our contract is written this way. So if you're using this contract and you're following the contract, mm -hmm. you're doing a traditional title company yeah. close. The, yeah, uh, con the contract is a format that provides a link. If they choose to go off road, that's right. God bless you. Right, and they have a lawyer to change the contract or write their mm -hmm. own contract, and then an agent can be involved. But if an agent is writing the contract, that's another thing that's going to happen. An agent can't change no, that's the not contract. Right but again, so not my example. I mean. What, where are we at? Uh, yeah, that's, 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 yeah. Oh, this is your job. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm about right. to pull the button. I think we can, uh, solve here. Right. We can move forward. This is the last <laughs> comment on the agenda item number six. So we'll we'll go forward to agenda item number seven, which it is. is. Wait, wait. That's Wait, did, did uh, Charles do both of his things? It's the same comment. Okay. Or same same issue. Well, there's a case. Could we do that? Okay. All the other comments are on seller's disclosure. Correct. Okay. Cool. So we have quite a few deferred comments from last meeting and also a discussion that's included in here that Ron Walker and I had regarding the calculation of deadlines. And this I'll start with the starting on agenda item seven is kind of a the back and forth Ron and I had, or at least Ron's email to me. Uh, this came up when somebody brought to our attention an article on Texas Realtors regarding how you calculate the number of days you have to terminate under paragraph 2B, the third party financing agenda, or in specifically in relating to when you have to provide the written notice of property denial. And the Texas Realtors article, um, Ron doesn't remember, you know, being part of it, but he cited in there, said if you have a closing on Friday that you have to terminate by Monday. They have to send the, the lender's uh, evidence of written denial from the lender by Monday. The prior Monday. The, so on Friday, so we count back three days, and then you have to go to the next day before that on the Monday. I think the general understanding, at least from myself and from all the agents that I've talked to, is it's Tuesday because you count, you don't count the first day, but you include the last day. And so it comes down to the language of the actual contract. And so what Ron provided here is he went back and looked at every instance he could find in the government code and in other areas on how is power timelines calculated, because we don't say that in the contract on how you calculate it. And so what the government code, what a lot of the, the civil practice and remedies code and other codes say is you, you don't count the first day, but you do count the last day. Right. So if we go to the actual language in the contract, can you, can you mind pulling that up? Hold on, because I got I'll learn more about teams next time. So this will be and Robin, feel free to jump in too if you have more information on this from the the site. Um, what section am I going to? You're going to two B on the third party financing. Third party financing. Third party financing, which I think I have open. Wait just a second. Everything. Okay. Yeah, that's it. To be. Just the second. Get it? There we go. Yeah. All right. And, now let me get. To the reason this came up again is it was brought up by several people, and then there is confusion out there, especially with the the article from Texas Realtors. So what are you looking at? Two B? You said on. Hold on. Oh, on it's two B on third party. Yeah, but but the it's a little different how it's worded. So that's this the is on, this is on our website. Yep. This is on a third party financing and then the mm -hmm. and then it's two B. Two B. Yep. Right. I'll go up, yeah. And before we read the language, um, Brian brought up on Trek's website there's a the same thing we talked about about you don't count the first day, but you do include the last oh, days listed on there. How handy. But if we look at the language here, it says 
buyer may get written notice of seller within uh, that's not it. Let's see. Here the buyer point. not later than three days before the closing date. Not later than three days before the closing date. Yeah. And the argument on the other side is, well, yeah. three days yeah. before the closing date is Tuesday. And you can't do it later, not later than that. Right? So if you get up to three days, that means you have to do it on Monday. And so it's it's different if that's the actual interpretation of this, it's different from how we calculate deadlines anywhere else in the contract. Interesting. And so that's the that's the the discussion point. Really. And we didn't Ron and I didn't come to a a firm decision. I think the his mind, he didn't remember that the article, but let's say it was also kind of falling in the direction of how Trek normally calculates days. And that's how I, how I've always understood it. But there's confusion out there um, and definitely something that that Texas Realtors is saying it's a, a Monday, at least that article. I thought it, I thought it was Monday. <clears throat> I didn't know there was confusion out there, but now you've confused me. Well, well you know, when you're definitely aware of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I thought I knew what I was doing. But when, oh, you, were counting, when you were counting the, uh, the option period, like you, sharks. you, you know, yeah. it's it's Has from that. So you, you, it's a little, it's a little confusing because the option period. If you have a three-day option period, and it's and the contract expected on Monday, you count Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So Thursday yeah. is the right. option period. But this, this is approval. This is, holding, but this is this is going back. Right. Saying saying not less than three days before, so it's a little confusing. Uh, in my mind, mentally, I might have said, okay, Friday's the closing, so don't count Friday, we count Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, so Tuesday's the day. So and that might be in my head. When but, you're but it's, back. Well, I well, counted well, the same way you did, but I still said Monday. Well, but <laughs> look, at, look at the closing, dis three. the disclosures, oh, okay. right? Lender disclosures. If you have the three-day disclosure requirement for a Friday closing, that means you have to do it by Tuesday. And that, that's an absolute... Back. I mean, there's no it, Friday closing. You have to close on. You have to, exactly which is what it. this chart here that was provided by this is American Land Title Association. This yeah, is provided. The yeah, mortgage yeah, the trade rules. Yeah, yeah, the trade rules. Mortgage and title company mm -hmm. uh, agents in our firm give that to the agents to help them understand the date. Right. And I thought it was CFPB that said it had to be the three days mm -hmm. in advance and. You know that would be and, and definitely before the closing date ugh, by reading that says it does include does not include friday mm -hmm. and then you go back so i can see where the confusion in that article mm -hmm. would be if you are not able to count tuesday so we do have to clarify that and, and it wasn't more of a practice that it was qualified in the article saying practically monday it didn't, it didn't give a definite answer but well, let's that's do it the, better too well, they need to add state holidays in the ones on there. Can you repeat what you said about the Friday to Tuesday is only three days? Thing? Yeah. So, so under Trek's guidance, Trek's guidance here on how to calculate deadlines and all this government code stuff says you don't count the first day, so you don't count Friday. Mm -hmm. Then you go back three days, and you do count the last day, right? So you go back Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday. So you have to give notice by Tuesday. Look at it in reverse, right. termination option, right? You don't count the effective date, but you count seven days right. out and you have all the way through the seven okay. days. Okay. I mean, I one thought, day before, two okay. days. I thought so you were three saying three that if four. something happened on Friday, that's the closing. You went to Tuesday, you went forward. You went forward to Tuesday. Oh, no, 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 sorry, no, backwards. Right. Okay. Yeah, backwards. So, okay. All right, so I'm back to not being up. confused. <laughs> so I was the same way. I was I, I'm sorry. He's yeah. saying the not later yeah. hands suggest on Mondays, right? Right, and that's what, again, that's, it's out there. So what's his that. suggestion? Cut the not later than? Uh, we don't have, we just noticed the issue because okay. it was brought up to us from several different angles and then having something that conflicts yeah, with what the standard and normal like practice that. is out there on an association website. Is, is What's the, the article on the track <coughs> website? What does it say? Oh, is it, is it actually specifically Texas, Texas, Texas Realtors? Texas Realtors. Do because oh, not on ours. Not on ours. But but okay. Trek's website okay. says you don't so count the first day, you count the last day. Well, but it, it's a matter about the contractual well, language. Here, here's, here's, yeah. here's, the, here's why it's happening. It's because we've all been thinking counting forwards. Right. Yes. Yes. right, and it and works counting forwards. It's when you're counting backwards. Right. Do you have to give if if the third day prior is a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday? 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would really screw us yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's why this chart is really handy because if it's Saturday, it tells you what it's supposed to do. But it comes down to here the contractual language, I think. That's that's the concern that yeah. I have is, just, is our the other ones, there's no doubt, right? And this one, it, it, it raises doubt because of the words that are used. And that's where I think we have to be the, careful. Sorry to throw you a dead horse on this. Mm -hmm. What is the confusion? Do some people read this and think, under your hypothetical, the closing date is on Friday. Do some people think they have to give termination by Monday? Yes. And some people think it's Tuesday. Tuesday. Correct. Yes. Great. Does anybody think it's Wednesday? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. It's understand. always whether it's Tuesday or, or, okay. or, or Monday is the issue. So I mean, obviously what it comes down to is a buyer gives yes, the yes, notice on Tuesday and the seller says, no, you had to do you that. You had to do it on Monday. Months. Right. Yeah. I'm just trying to get it clear in my head. Yeah. 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 I'm not. No. All right. I'm going to have your new standards. Yep. Yeah, not lighter than so it seems we're, to be we're talking about. So do we know why the article was written that way? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I'm sending the article to SJ so she can pull it up. The way that's um, worded seems to be Tuesday. I can ask Yeah, it's Tuesday to me. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. In. I think it was 2021 when it came out. I was able to find it. So we did do a uh, uh, an event with Ron Walker where he was a speaker to explain third party financing and the appraisal addendum. And this write up was a kind of summary after that of the things that were discussed during that. So it would have come up during that presentation, during that video, and that was the and that was what was discussed and the and the probably what exactly was said. And it even says in the article, it's confusing, right? Right, and exactly. Say, and that's why you use so, this word practically to, to qualify. It, right, like, um, yeah, and, and it is confusing. Uh, but it's, so it's being used, the concern out there is just being used by agents as evidence of, hey, you didn't terminate on time. You gave it to me on Tuesday. Yeah. Texas Realtors is saying you have to terminate on Monday. And if, that we were asked Monday. That, if we were asked that question on the legal hotline, for example, we would, we would provide this explanation. They say, well, they didn't do it, so it's so it's false, right? And I, we can't say that. It would have to, it's a fact issue at that point, right? And then it goes to interpretation by a court or by the attorneys. Okay, attorneys, what's your viewpoint? Well, here, here's, let, let me give you an example. Let's say closing date is Friday. What would one day before closing be? Is there any dispute it would be Thursday? It would be Thursday. <coughs> so what would Tuesday, two days be? Wednesday. Tuesday. <laughs> 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 okay, so, 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 I mean, if, 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 if you think about it logically, one day is Thursday. That means two days is Wednesday. That means three days is Tuesday. <laughs> and not, <laughs> and not later than <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well done, Brad. <laughs> He's just, and then the problem goes to midnight. <laughs> so does that well, no, it, it got kicked back to me. After at twelve oh one, it's too late. It would seem that the answer is yes. I just copied it. So you need to trade on Monday, right? <laughs> is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Need, Sorry. Well, if twelve oh one, which is Tuesday. If you have to terminate three days before, not that later than. mean that you have to have terminated before 1201, which is Monday. It's saying your, your he just he's yeah. just saying if you miss it at midnight, you you put in the termination at 1201, you're really on Monday. Yeah, you'd really be on because what he's uh, what Brian's saying going is backwards. that three days going backwards is Tuesday. Tuesday starts at 12 I would say one. Nine so to Ron's comment on that in that article, you better terminate on Monday because mm -hmm. Tuesday starts you, well the language three days before closing. And so it's not three days, it's not later, 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 later than but not later than later. later, I, later. I will invoke the not greater than five percent rule. This is it, it's well, funny why the reason is the that. reason it's brought up is I had at least two people reach out within a week's time on this exact issue Good and then it's then i talked to, to it's, been uh, in it's been in there but but in my understanding and everybody else's that i've dealt with is it's tuesday and then seeing this yeah. article that's out there it says monday and that's so it's a county forward article no this is directly on yeah, this did you get it i'm sorry i'm thinking oh, and so we'll, we'll pop it up but so so there's from everybody's general understanding that i'm aware of 
and then we have something completely different. And so that's why I think if there is confusion out there, is there something we need to change in the not later than if we truly mean it to be Tuesday? Or is not later than or where else? Okay, that's just you have a couple outliers in an article that are different from everybody's understanding. So is that saying that if a buyer terminates on Tuesday at five o'clock, is that three days before closing? It's not a full day. And that's where it goes in because then under how we count uh, every other deadline in the contract exactly. includes that last exactly. day. I have a way to change it oh. to make it clearer. So if we re really mean three days and I, I don't know what we meant, but I think clarity is a good thing. So today, if we mean three days, if we say buyer three days before closing date or sooner, because we don't want people to wait yeah. if they can give it sooner, but that three days before or sooner. How the three mean? days before would get us yeah. to Tuesday, not Monday, Tuesday for real. At least three days. Well, at least gets I don't the think not later at than least is, is a not later than. That's what I'm saying. I think let's not put anything ahead of the three days modifying it and put anything behind it to explain that they could, don't have to wait. Does that make three sense? Three days, so buyer, comma, three days before or the closing, closing date or, or earlier. Or earlier. May terminate this contract, blah, blah, blah. I don't think them thinking they have to don't wait. Say four the days. Well, but we are. Mm -hmm. But the legal interpretation, I think we can agree, is concerning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, exactly. I, I don't disagree, and I've and my the reason I had my hand raised was to ask how can we how can we make it more clear? I just on the third day before <laughs> closing date or early. No. How about three, on the third day. Days. So the day before well, the closing that would make it say three days, days before. Why are we, we why because they're they're problems. getting into the well but you know, about right. Well Jesus hours. died on Friday and rose on Sunday. <laughs> 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 on the third day. I knew that was coming. But what if it's Rosh Hashanah? If a year of our Lord twenty twenty Brian, Brian, in the title world, the documents have to be provided to the buyer three days before closing, right? So what are your three days? I'm sorry. You mean you mean the, the seller's disclosure? Well, I, well all the, yes. Yeah. Yes. That those those are the trade rules. That, so that what, little, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what do, would this not go along with those same three days that the title company has? Per no. I mean that's 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 a regulatory definite. Those are regulatory rules. Those I think don't really necessarily it, it, follow. Where did our where we word added, come from then? We added the language. So we added the language yeah, on this committee right. fairly recently here. And, and, and I think the intent at the time, and, and I speak for my intent when I was drafting it was was Tuesday. You know, the three days following the same lines yeah. as the yeah. three days before. Um and I'll I'll speak for my own intent, you know, on that. But that's that's what my understanding of it was. I think most people have that understanding, but there is confusion. Yeah, and when we look at earnest money and option fee and how agents are schooled on the by midnight, by midnight, so they think midnight, if a date's not, uh, a time is not included, this is very different. And it has raised concerns when they are down to the wire and the buyer has their right to terminate under the lender's provisions on the property. And then the question does come up. Did we have to do it by midnight on Monday or do we have any time on Tuesday? And okay. where is that answer written? And I, I think it's a good point. I have an idea that I have not vetted and I'm not sure I lie. <laughs> White word that. But, well, but, just, <laughs> but in order to clarify, what if instead of saying three days prior, we put in a blank, and so they could agree on when that notice had to be given? You know, hopefully they would do something reasonable, but there would be an actual date there, so there wouldn't be a discrimin discrepancy. Because what I've learned sitting at the table is we don't know how to count backwards. <laughs> So the concern there that comes to mind is um, we can't control the lenders and the appraisals that come in. Like, you know, yeah, one of the big reasons we can't why. three day rule either. <clears throat> what? And Say that the, last part. We can't. What? We can't control them with the three day rule either. I, mean, I agree with Brian. This is uh, less than five. However, if we wanted to clarify it, what I would do is I would, 
I would the buyer may terminate this contract up to three days before closing by giving seller. I think that almost in my mind gets back to the same quagmire is not yeah, better than. I think it's exactly the same. Does okay. using the term 72 hours then leave it any different? <laughs> yeah, because then we start counting hours. I'm just saying, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it's in it. Then it's, we're starting to count by hours, not days. Is that better or worse? Worse. <laughs> no, that's worse. You said it at 508. You have to count higher. So what, yeah. that's what, worse. what if we just took out the not later thing? I think that's what the confuse, confusing part is. The, everything else is calculated where you include the third day, right? And so if, if we took out not later than, in the three days before closing, I don't think there would be I, as much of an issue. Would, would it be at, at all ambiguous if you, instead of saying not later than three days before the closing date, you just say on or before the third day before the closing date? Um, I like that. Okay, here's the article. I like that. On or before the third day before the closing date. I like the date. The day before the closing date is Thursday. The second day is one. Let's go with it. I would still say, I'm fine with that, but I would still say buyer may terminate, and then and then include your yes your mm -hmm. language. But can we still? I think the backwards? confusing part is you say buyer and then you throw in the qualifier and then you throw in the deadline. Mm -hmm. If you say buyer may terminate and then whatever Brian said, on or before third day, that is easier to understand and not get. Okay, hold on just a second. Buyer may terminate, comma, on or before the third day before the closing date, comma. No, I don't think that no, I think what you're saying is to say buyer may terminate this contract on or before the yes, third day. Yes, that's right. Before the closing date. Yes. By giving seller Yep, that's right. This so, isn't the challenge, the counting backwards. So as long as we're using the word before, so we haven't solved the problem. Yes. Which again, I think mine is better only in that there's no modifiers in front of the three days. That's what I'd like to get rid of. So buyer three days before the closing or sooner or earlier. I think we use earlier. May terminate the contract, la, 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 la. I like that except for the earlier. They know they can do it earlier. Well, we've used earlier. Oh, okay. We used it already. We used that in the contract. One more time. Okay, well, I like that. Read it out loud. So, instead of this, buyer not later than three days before the closing, buyer, scratch, not later than, buyer three days before the closing date or earlier, sooner, whatever, may terminate the contract by giving notice. I'm okay with that, but I'm still going to, and I'm, I don't care, honestly. <laughs> I would say buyer, what did you say? I just buyer, buyer out, not later than. Buyer may terminate this contract three days before closing. Yeah, that's how normal. Or sooner. That's how normal. Yes. Yeah, he's saying Let's change the grammar, put the verb in I front. like that the best. You want to put that in the Okay, say notes. it again. Buyer may terminate this contract three days before closing. Yeah. No, they still can't count backwards. Or earlier. Do we uh, we want to make sure they can do it earlier. Yeah. But weren't we having the issue on how to count? It was part of the portion. We don't like the The language came down to what what is not later than me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And okay. I think that, that's okay. really the confusing part. Ron, not not later let's just cut it. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then, then I, mis I misunderstood. Hold on just a second. So whatever y'all said. I'm about to pop it up for you. <laughs> so it's an if an article, well, we think, can, yeah. if, if an article yes. is written, or an, an FAQ in uh, by Trek, and the closing was Friday, with that wording, does the buyer have to terminate by midnight on Monday? It's my opinion. It's, 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 it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday. Well, at least we've narrowed it down to Monday or Friday. Because we're saying the third day is versus three days. Right. The, you know, the okay. confusion yeah. did just a second. I've got it. And it was written by Lee Johnson to the Trade Association, so 150,000 people read it. Right. 
But that's true. And if that's no, they not, did. <laughs> <laughs> they did. Oh, <laughs> they did. <laughs> they did. But, is this it? The author wrote, read it. <laughs> is this it? Yeah. Oh, wait. I didn't even um, read buyer it. May turn this this is is it. Let's see. Buyer may terminate uh -huh. this contract <laughs> before closing date or earlier. Just why I thought I knew what I was doing. I, yes. I like that. I like that. Yes. I like yes. that. Okay. Yes. The third it day. It was the same. I, I, I would Buyer may terminate this contract no, three no. days before the closing date or earlier by giving. Instead of three days, okay, I, I would say. be confusing to the agent. Honor before the third day. No. So the reason the, the third, the third day, day means the entire third day. Exactly. Three days is. No, it's just three days before, and then you go to your traditional. This, oh, wait, 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 wait. No, I, I, I am, I am going with Ryan's thought here. Because this. With this. Can we do one of these? Hold on. So, Court of Porter can only take one person. Yep. So the, the issue was not later then, right? And that was the confusion. By adding three days before is that I think legally going under government code, going under Trex things will include that Tuesday. We'd be able to do Tuesday. Tuesday. But adding Brian's language may help the layman understand that. And I tell you, when I read this, I read it. I read this 20 times. I, I've talked to my wife, talked to Ron. We, we were confused going back and forth on what does it actually mean. By putting in honor before. Can we hear from Robin? There's no doubt. He's the one that caused the confusion. So, so counting this, I mean, so this is much more clear, right? Because you have the closing date. And then, like Brian was saying, what's one day before the closing, two and three? And so it's clear that Tuesday is three days before the closing. Assuming the closing is Friday. When I read this. Assuming it's right. Yeah. Friday. Right. I think we just are staying on that. What would you say the Tuesday before closing? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was say. Why would keep saying Tuesday? What if closing is Monday? Get <laughs> that in there. Right. And, it's, and it's midnight. There's no, right. no time restriction. Just pick a day of the week and let's move in. Right. So, do you like this language or, or would you prefer honor before? Oh, I, honor before the third. <laughs> right. I don't know that I would say one way or the other. Okay. I, mean, I think this yeah. this is an improvement. I'll take joy in the improvement. Let, ca closing date is capitalized. Right. Well, let's put this in. Let's. I'll marinate on this issue and we'll you want me to put it put in the this, minutes. Do you want me to put the other option do that. Honor before. with the honor before? No. I think we leave this and, and think. Let's just do one. And then next time we can revisit it. <coughs> to be revisited. What about the layman? Three days before the closing. <laughs> and we'll, okay. we'll have the discussion at <coughs> Texas Realtors on the article if we need to pull it down. If it's we, the last thing we want is confusion. And what our interpretation is. So we'll discuss it uh, based on this and so that we're on the same page. Thank you. John, would it be appropriate for uh, a Trek FAQ to be requested that talked about the timing? You've got some great FAQs uh, on Trek that I don't know enough agents know about the way they go to the Texas Realtors one if they're a realtor. Sure. Would it be appropriate in the consideration of time if we're all agreeing that it's Tuesday, if we're closing on Monday, a Friday, to write something about it so we can point agents to the timing on if the buyer has the right to get uh, to terminate under the property? Absolutely. What date is it? If we do that, I think we, we will say that. You have to close on a Friday so that we can <laughs> rest on the Tuesday. What you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Now let me ask okay. you this question. That'll work. What if closing date is Wednesday? <laughs> oh, you all right. You got closed on Friday. <laughs> It's I guess you can give notice of termination on, on Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Sure. It's a cal week calendar days. Okay. Well, that was a... <laughs> I think fun. fruitful discussion and I can't tell you how many hours I thought about that. Um, and going back and forth. So thank you for entertaining me. So um, I believe if you go to page number 19 in our materials, it has a list. This is our old uh, minutes from our last meeting. And under subsection K has a list of things we would say we would consider at a subsequent 
meeting and discussion. Some of these we've talked about, um, but we can, we can march through these. So the first one there is reconsidering changes to paragraph three after evaluating experience in the market, um, which I don't think we have enough data at this point. Paragraph three, of course, being the change to the cash portion of the sales price. Uh, changing the term escrow agent to escrow agency. And escrow agent is a defined term. Well, in in the title insurance. Oh, in our in our forms is defined. And the question is, should we change that defined term to agency? And the issue being, a, uh, real estate agents are putting in because names of escrow insurance. officers, yeah. not the actual title agency. I think SJ may have brought up at one of the prior meetings. Well, there could be individuals acting as the um, the escrow agent, and so wouldn't check that would be an agency or a lawyer. Um, but there is, uh, or on page nineteen um, under subsection K. These were deferred items. Correct. These were deferred from our, yeah. our last meeting that we What is it called through. in the contract? Is it it's escrow, escrow agent, agent means the title company, correct? Well, no. So the this it's is where it gets into the, the you ask. You're right. The basic manual says you have title, the title company is meant to be the underwriter center. Correct. First American, Chicago, whoever it might be. The escrow agent hmm. might be the title company if it's a direct operation, if they're running it. Mm -hmm. But it there's also many, many independents out there. And so if it's an independent, you would put in hometown title. And then you would, in title company, you're supposed to list whatever underwriter you want. Most people just would put hometown, hometown, right? right? Does it cause any problems? It hasn't caused any real problems. The issue with the definition of escrow agent versus agency is the agents putting in language or the name of the escrow officer. Right. And one of the comments in the last meeting that we received was, well, then they're making checks out to the escrow officer, not the escrow agency. Well, um, I don't. Shame on them. There's at least one or two comments on that. I don't see that as it, that's a big issue. It's that's also definitely. An, it's also an out that if I put Susie Smith at such and such agency, and Susie Smith now goes to another agency, <laughs> it's a total out because you made that escrow agent part of the contract. I always need to put just the agency well but hold on legally the agency is the agent correct so well in, in the issue is addressing the confusion I was, I was gonna say what's our what are we what's our scope what are we trying to determine here we determine whether there's enough confusion out there with people writing in escrow officers in the escrow agent a field. human person instead why of, correct. why, are, instead why of does our contract provide for these escrow agents to get a commission and make money why did it this doesn't make we have to why do we put their no, name no, in why does it matter well be, yeah. because, because the escrow agent is different from <laughs> oh that's right every independent yeah you're right okay, sorry, you're so right. so we have to split it up that way I'm, uh, you could you could use somebody for a title commitment and a different agency as the you're right i just Normally, see people fill out Clark. Sally's name and his title company, and they don't even connect yes, the dots that exactly. they're different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that's, that's where it saying. hasn't caused a big problem. But there was comments about it this last meeting of checks actually being written to individuals, not the title, company, so the title agency. SJ is talking that, <laughs> <laughs> that, the, that the contract does say I have to use a title company. So my question is. If we were to change the words escrow agent to escrow agency, what would be the harm? And that's that's a good If there's point. no harm, then let's just do it and fix well, the confusion. But if there's harm, then I we need to say, can I say she, as you noted, it may be it could be an individual. I, I think it could agent be a, is a term it of could art, be an attorney. I think it it needs to it, independent title is kind of it can be an agency or it can be a human, like a lawyer. Yeah. But is a title company a, a, a single okay the title the remember there's three functions that a title company can perform one is acting as an escrow agent right one is issuing a commitment and a policy and one Clark's note. Well, it's sort of the escrow. It's, 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 it's receiving, receiving the settlement, <laughs> the settlement function, and those are three separate jobs, and they don't have to be done by the same person. 
or agency to hold the money. Right? Yeah, like a fee attorney. I'm not an escrow agent. That's right. Can I say that? Does she just teach me the terms? I'm just thinking. Truthfully, no, we're, we're yeah, concerned about agents yeah. perceiving this. I think yeah, an agent that's yeah, stupid yeah, enough to think that the agent, escrow agent, es that the escrow officer is escrow agent, is likely to make the same confusion with escrow yeah, agent. Exactly. Okay. I don't think we're really going to. Uh, great yeah. point. Fix okay. Well, in we, the other thing, I'm just going to comment here just for a second. Is the time. the the. Type in first the issue of people type. purposely putting in escrow officers' names because oh, right. they want to designate who they want to work on yes, their file. Right. Um, but well, the, the only other thing you could do, and you know, this is what we used to do on the State Bar Real Estate Forms Committee, is we just create a defined term. But the problem is that it takes extra words, and we may not want to go to that trouble. But you can define the term very carefully as to what it means. Which, and I believe Scott has a, a comment. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on, everybody. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, and in just the contract itself, escrow agents mentioned 35 times. Title companies mentioned like six. In real practice, we put the escrow agent, which not is not necessarily a title company, could be a fee office, could be an attorney, and then we identify slash John Smith. That way, when you go to one branch and they say who's closing this file, it references them. I mean, if they put the closer's name there. Y'all, we can't legislate idiots. I'm sorry. That's that. That's a tranquil issue. Escrow agent, 35 times they have responsibility. Disperse funds, collect funds, prorate rent. A agent covers it. I don't. I don't see changing it to agency, because I mean the promulgated new promulgated contracts class talks about the escrow agent, and it's not the title company. It's whoever is escrowing it. Title company. The contract says. You have to get a title policy from a title company who will provide it, but escrow agent can be anybody. And we have a we have a small office in Snyder. It's an attorney. It's a fee office. There you go. Directly not a title company. So I, I think this is minimized. I, I have to ask, what is uh, the story behind the Wilson behind you there? That's a uh, on the 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 uh, volleyball with the. Uh, during the pandemic, we were open for like three months. I was the only one here, so an agent brought that to me, so I wouldn't be lonely. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? I get more comments over that than I do the governor's photo right above it. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Okay, I think it falls within the 5% rule. Well, if any, unless somebody has any objection, we'll move on. So, no, it's dead. We've dead. addressed it. Yes. It's not going forward anymore. Dead. Do not no, forward. No, no, no. Okay, I think this next one we're going to see how it is in practice so we probably don't have enough feedback yet but moving the proposed changes to paragraph 6e to paragraph 22 and placing check boxes before the different types of requirements we, well, we, we just don't want to we do just that. dealt with that yep. we had a discussion about that earlier and and there that somewhat fit in with the duplication on the PID notice well, and that's specifically so. discussed on what we'll do there but i think we need to see how it works out a little bit more before considering that Next one, review the new home construction forms. And I would propose that we wait to see what changes are coming yeah. out um, and then maybe form a, a subcommittee to do a deep dive into those once we get the statutory changes. Okay. From a uh, legislative session. session? Correct. Yeah. Uh, number five, including the non-realty items addendum in paragraph 22, which we've discussed this ad nauseum too at, at many meetings, it. that lenders don't want to see it. That's why they're not included there. That. Like scratch it right off the list. Um, and I, I vote the same way. If somebody has any three of us. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Off. We're moving. We're moving. moving. Keep yeah. going. Review of the 2A of the third party financing. Oh, wait. Reviewing the lease objection rights in paragraph 6F of the farm and ranch contract form. Okay. Give me a second. Mm -hmm. <coughs> farm and ranch. This was the lender required repairs that we. No, we're not free. No, I'm in the wrong one. Sorry. Six F. Yeah. What's the surface form leases? Number? Surface leases. Well, Twenty-five, fifteen. We did that. We had a farm ranch subcommittee. So couldn't we just look at it? I thought we just did it. Is this on the new one? Uh, and yeah. this really is. I'm noting for the record, it's taken two of us to do Ron's job. And I think we did it. I made that motion earlier. 
Where so do you want to go in the form? Well, it, the comment was about 6F termination rights. Um, <laughs> but we, we did the new surface lease section in paragraph 4. And in paragraph 6F, we took out language and just left in the following surface leases will be permitted exceptions. We put a lot of time the yeah. the whole team did. Well, we, we, we really discussed did. at the last <coughs> meeting, uh, in fact, I, I suggested that in 4D surface leases <coughs> that we say that these existing leases would <coughs> need to be permitted and not objected to. And people said, no, there might be situations where there are leases that are there now you don't want them to be permitted. You want them to go away before closing. That's why we left 6F the way it is. You probably need to repeat that using English and about half the words one more time. I thought that was a pretty good number of words. Was it? Yeah. All right. Well, can you repeat that again? Okay. Par paragraph, we, we addressed it. We did not address it in paragraph 4D with the new surface leases. We left it. We left it. 4D is yeah, the description of what the surface leases are. Okay, stop. we disclosed. Stop. Let's show it real quick. Okay. Here's leases. And SJ wasn't here at the last meeting to okay. hear this, so that's yeah. So that's part of that 4D right describes the oh, surface leases. Right. And the question was, do we want to say, <laughs> and they're all permitted? Right. And the, the answer was no, there might be surface might leases be that are not, not permitted. And so right. we need to have it in 6F. Which, okay, so now we've looked at surface leases. They either have delivered or they haven't. Mm -hmm. And then there's oral surface leases, mm -hmm. possibly. Right, right. Okay, and now we're to 6F, which is. Just in case some under, are not permitted. Under title yeah. notice. Now, title. I, it's title for later. Yeah. Right, I'm, right. I'm just going to say, would it make logical sense to move 6F up into 4D so it's all together? We discussed that, and I don't I don't even have a, really an opinion, but what we came to was it needed to be down there with title because it wasn't a disclosure. Right. And it was a title exception versus a disclosure. I don't. I don't really know one way. And it was this is number. instruction to the title <laughs> company. <that it's> <laughs> right. And it was and already the there people. before, so people are used to have those right. that do the farm and ranch are used to being able to scratch have a that one off and let's move on. All, All right. right, that's All right. We're yeah, let's do that. Yes, I agree. Okay. Okay. Now the reviewing party. paragraph two a third party financing addendum for purposes of requiring information from the lender if buyer is not able to obtain buyer approval. So this is the, if we're on um, seven, um, Roman numeral seven. So the, the issue here is uh, for property approval, we now require written documentation from the lender that the property did not approve. And for that to be shown three days before closing to maintain that termination right. What is proposing here <laughs> is do we do the same thing for buyer approval? Because the issue, we have a lot of buyers saying I didn't get approved, and they're not showing any evidence of it. And of course, we have a different deadline here. It has to be done within so many days of the effective date. Right? And time is of the essence for this one. This is one of the very few ones that time is of the essence. And we know how to count it. And so I'll tell you about the brokers. I mean, what with your experience in this, are you having issues with sellers saying, hey, did they really not get approved or I want to see evidence of it? Right. <clears throat> we always ask for a letter. I, mean, I trust the lender, I guess. But it, are you always getting that letter? Is there an issue of the buyers not providing it? Well, I've always said if that's Here's Scott. the check mark you're terminating for. Scott's mm -hmm. wanting to talk about yeah. yeah, I mean, I totally agree. The lender doesn't have to furnish anything. And, and we've seen it where they terminated here and wrote up one of our other listings. And we have nothing from the lender, but they have the right. And buyer approval is only credit income and assets. It's not appraisal and all that other stuff. So I, I'd like this MT there. We've gotten, I've gotten emails from brokers all over Texas about this, that it's a free out. Yeah. Without any documentation. Well, yeah, keep, I agree. Yes. Keep in mind, A and B are different. Exactly. Exactly. B is talking about 
the lender affirmatively decides the property does not meet his underwriting requirements for the loan. I don't like the appraisal. I don't like the foundation. I don't like the roof. And so you have to give a reason. But 2A is merely saying, I wasn't able to get anybody to give me loan approval. And, and a lender may not you didn't give, an answer. give you anything. Well, if it's in a contract, though, then they'd have to. No, you know, they're, they're not a party. Either. They're not a party. Now, no. your response could be, well, wait a second. That's the buyer's fault going to a lender that won't give them a letter. But... <laughs> Well, well, I, 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 but if you're, I if, thought about this, and I'm, at, I'm at peace with the way it is right I now. I am too, because let's say they give a letter. So what? They went to one lender, and one lender won't get them. Home. Is that really good enough? Oh, yeah. That's, That's what efforts, I think. Well, and it does say they'll make, what is the actual language efforts. on that? It's, it's, it's every, I mean. Make every reasonable effort. That's, okay. that's my point, right? So if they go to one lender and one lender gives them a letter, is that good enough? It's not well, it's all they can do in that time period, maybe. Um, maybe. <laughs> John? I, I agree with Brian. It's good the way it is. Mm -hmm. For years, to be did not have mm -hmm. what it has today, where you had to get uh, something in writing from the lender mm -hmm. to prove that indeed it didn't meet under lend underwriting no, lender's requirements. That's a fairly recent change. Yes, and it's a good change because the concern the sellers had: how do I know that you know it didn't appraise because they didn't have to give a copy of an appraisal? And I can see where on the buyer side, the exact same thing. Buyer just changed his mind. But didn't have any other way out. So now they're using, oh, well, I can't get the loan. Gee, so sorry. So it seems it should be even Stephen on both sides. Well, it, it's a two points that come off that in their first. Our last discussion to throw these on the table when we added it to 2B, and the concern was raised well, buyers aren't going to be able to get that from the lender. Lenders aren't going to provide it. Well, it should be the buyer's obligation because they're the ones that are having the app. They should know in advance and, and tell the lender in advance. Money back. And the, the flip side on the buyer approval, it's not the, the issue with property approval is just to be done on closing day. There People show up and say didn't appraise right. and yeah. I'm walking. Yeah. On buyer approval, we're going from the beginning of the contract and it's most of the time way before closing. Yeah. And so they're mitigating, not, not that that weighs on anything, but just practically speaking. And I think that's um, heavily influential on why we made the changes and keep that exact point. On the closing day yes. terminations, but I do agree. We hear it a lot, like like Scott says, that people are using it as a free app and not providing evidence. And so there is a lot of that. I think it might be more than five percent or um, I think so. on that. I truly believe it's more than five percent. Um, the, the property approval needed to be done, but we had somebody terminate two weeks ago, and their pre-qualifying letter says they've determined assets, credit. And, uh, and, uh, and 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 income, but then they still terminated because they didn't get meet buyer approval. You get no documentation. This is truly a free out, no questions asked, no nothing. And I just, I mean, we see it every day in our office where, you know, they they do, they it's a free out. There's no documentation, no nothing. And so I. I think it's more than 5%. Now, the market's changed, but I still think it's more than 5% that are dealing with this. And we have other brokers in there. I mean, how many sellers have you talked to that were frustrated because they have no documentation, and then the people buy a house a month later? Yeah, so it's an issue. What if we throw some language together and see if we agree with it or not? All right. If we copy the language out of 2B okay. and tailor it for... I think even if we look at it and don't come up with a solution that works, it at least tells those brokers that are emailing me, hey, we're looking at it. There might not be a solution, but I think we need to at least look at it. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Okay. And remember, buyer approval has two components to it. The terms of the loan are available and the lender has determined the buyer is satisfied. Uh, so the lo loan could have changed. All right. This is the existing thing um, A and B. So what do you want to do, sir? 
let's see. It doesn't have the blank for within days, but it's, yeah. Can you make that just a little bit bigger? Sure enough. Thank you. I <coughs> cannot. Yeah, I'll stick that number in there. So we need to rewrite the second sentence. Yes. Well, buyer may give written notice. So that second, now, that second sentence is okay. You mean if well, if buyer, it, if buyer doesn't terminate by the by the provision, no, that that's okay because we want. It's really the third. Yeah, but well, well, no, I think it's the second sentence. If buyer cannot obtain buyer approval, <laughs> I think here's where we would change it to say buyer, and then if you take the language from B, buyer may terminate this contract. By giving. We can talk about whatever the days are over by giving seller, and then that's where you would list the information that they have to do. So if it's the same, then it would be also be the notice of termination and is a copy of a written will. That this is where the difficulty is, right? A copy of a written statement from lender setting forth the reasons for lender's determination. I mean, that actually kind of works if they can actually get it. I think that's just the issue. Moving right? us down to give us room. Buyer cannot obtain buyer approval. Buyer may terminate this contract by giving the seller notice, terms, copy of the written statement for the lender's determination. That's just pulling it from down there. Yeah. Oh, we have to put the time period. Right. That, yeah. May terminate this contract within, within blank days. Time period's already in the buyer approval so many days. So we're, we're moving, we're having to move that around to uh, work with the new language. Um, so you could just say May within. Well, you can just, you can have it within or after. Right there, just right, right here. Yeah. yeah. The effective date should be capitalized right? okay. within blank days of the effective date. Just after the effective date. After, um, yeah, it was blank days after the effective Yeah, after. Sorry. It actually is not capitalized. We talked about that. Really? Yeah, because I thought it was too last time we talked about it. Mm -hmm. it should be. Oh, this it's capitalized. No, well, it's not capitalized. It's not capitalized. It's not in there right now. Let me do a quick search here in the deal and see if it's. The page, uh, page nine contract. It has it. Yeah. Well, then we need to check it on the identity anyway. You know, I personally do not have a problem putting an obligation on the buyer to get something from their lender. Okay, in, but in, <laughs> oh, it's only okay. We're in the addendum, and the addendum that's the only time it's mentioned. But in the contract, you're saying effective date is is defined. Okay. Well, I, 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 I have a problem. Right. The only determination is two I. Yeah. Yes, you're correct. Yes. But there is no determination for one I. So a statement from the lender setting forth the reason for a lender's determination only applies if the lender has determined that buyer is not satisfied the requirements or, or well, that the loans aren't available. Right. Lender determines that the, they can't. The, the well, loan I'm, you I'm requested the, is not available. Well, I'm the lender. I'm the lender, and I ha I yeah. think I'm going to approve you in a couple of days, but I haven't approved you yet. How? I guess I'll write a letter saying I have not yet been able to complete the process of credit. You're, you're inviting well, all what kinds if, what of problems with the language that you're going to mandate yeah. that the lenders yeah. specifically say and get Sally or Jim in that building. Like, hey, I need I need you to write something. And they write something like, well, that didn't suffice. That wasn't good enough. You can't, I mean. They said the same thing, though, too, about 2B when we added that requirement. How are we going to get it from the lenders? What's it going to say? What's the yeah. nature of that? I know, but I mean, you're just imposing more and more on the lender, more and more on these people to get that information see, to see, appease yeah. everybody. I, but they're I, terminating I, the contract. That's a powerful yeah, right. I, I, yeah, I look at exactly. it in two but ways. The seller, a, the seller agreed to give them that right. Let's not forget that. She right. The, but, seller, the seller gave them this free out. Okay. Yeah. And the seller doesn't have to give it to them. 
And if they want to give it to them, they can give it to them for the exact same number of days that the option period is. That's right. And you can say it's not subject to approval. It's not, we're going to give you the right, we're going to let you check the box, and then we're going to really scrutinize how you're going to do it. It's like, sorry, if you're upset about it, then sue me and sue the lender said. And, and by the way, I've gone down this road many, many, many times. The lender is going to do what the buyer asks them. All the lender has to say is, hey, you've got $100,000 sitting in this account, which I'm using to qualify you. Oh, well, I'm about to spend that hundred thousand dollars. Oh, okay, well then you don't qualify. Right, right, right. It's 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 not that hard. Okay. Yeah. yeah any, if, I, if, I, if I've got to get turned down by a lender, I can do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 I, I, mean, I, I like it the way it is right now because yes. if you think about it, B is talking about the situation. Okay, I got my lender, and now my lender is seeing whether the property satisfies the underwriter. A, I'm shopping for a lender. You say the lender. There is no sure. the lender. That's right. There's tons of us. There, there are lots of lenders right. out there. And so. What if one says yes? I, I don't I don't no. I don't know that any change we make is going to prevent the evil we're trying to. Avoid. It's not. Well, I, I can tell you, I think you'll this, shop for a lender. Any lender will. Hey, can you. Tell me, that's can right. I get a that under 250 grand market, they're talking to 20 different people that will lend early mortgage broker, everybody on Facebook. There is no V lender. His point right. is his point is not if one all he has to have is one to say no. Right. That's all you need. Yeah. But you that's can have 10 yes. No, it's every and reasonable effort. True. And so I mean, no, so no, how many no, how many lenders do I need to get? It's it. the dishonest part. Yeah, we're trying okay. to solve, that's trying to solve that practically. Right. Yes, right. Well, I think this advances the discussion, you know, the language there. If we did change something, I think would lead down that line. Uh, maybe we can all marinate on this more and come back in the next meeting and discuss again. Scott, hopefully that'll help with your, your contacts that we are considering it. And it, it is a good discussion because it definitely happens a lot. There may not be a good practical fix, but it does happen a lot. In practice, I think we use that same date as the same date of determination option. So if there's 14 days, there's 14 days. Now I'm going to I think mostly you see 20 yeah. days or 14 you see days. A longer and then period here. Yeah, almost every one days. I see. Yeah, yeah so they so always want 21 days there because the lender days. says they can't do uh, approval until they run it. But if this is you have your option the problem that's getting yeah. used, then Agents need to make the period short. I'm not going to people. Well, it's not getting to be. It's I'm always fine. been that way. I just don't get an offer. And at 1021 days, for as long as yeah. that I'm totally, going totally to go. Totally years. Years. The lender runs the like transaction, and they're not yeah. already yeah. through the contract. But if this is such That's a problem, problem, then agents need to be short on this time problem. And I think the seller deserves to know that, indeed, there is a lender out there that that buyer actually has gone to and is willing to write a letter to say, we cannot make a loan. And if the buyer wants out that badly, you know, it, but I think it, it's only fair <clears throat> to the seller to make it even as we, you work very hard on making a 2B have more uh, bite to it and proof. There's a big difference between A and B. Well, admittedly, but it's still a deal coming together or not or falling apart. I don't, but, you know. Well, by putting this out there, maybe this will invite yeah. some comments that people exactly. will read we'll our agenda open. and and we'll leave it open to the next meeting. This, this is not a, a recommendation. No. no. Of this committee. Conversation. Okay. Uh, no. Next one. This is for the uh, farm and ranch group here. I think uh, was left off discussion about possibly including a notice of 1031 exchange transactions for the farm and ranch, and then of course the other forms as well. But. I've always been taught that you don't have to put anything for the contract back. Well, the tax law. All you have to do at, at the time you do the assignment mm -hmm. into the, the qualified intermediary is you just need to notify the other party that you're doing an exchange. That's all the tax code is. Right. All you okay. have to do, and it doesn't have to be in the contract. And 1031, maybe you won't realize, yeah. is the section of the tax code. And right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So if, but if the transaction is contingent, upon that 1031 exchange, then you need something in the contract to establish the contingency. Well, that, that's where they need to go to a lawyer, I think, that is true. Out, right? Because yes. yes. the... I just dealt with one that Again, blew up. That's a, if they go to a lawyer when you ask them to, that'd be great. Yeah, come, come on you. Doesn't the administrator wait, for the 1031 have wording that they tell yeah, the buyers should be in I, I, I want to pull this back to the whole point of why the subcommittee put this. This is, again, a notice. 
It is just a notice. This is not the everything about the 1031, but this is another thing for the seller to be able to evaluate that this deal has 1031 hair on it. It's going to take longer. Right. Okay, now, hold on, hold on. Hang on, hang on. So are you talking about the seller's going to do 1031, buyer 1031, or either or? Good question. That is a great question. I think, hair on it, maybe I, think we, uh, <laughs> I think we were thinking about buyers, but um, that is a great question, yeah. too. Yeah, I have some more. I mean, it may take longer, so, it may not take longer, depends think, on how they negotiate it, but that's a good point. Are we thinking for a thought that has something like the seller disclosures in no, paragraph 7? No, if I and, remember, and my committee will correct me, I think we were thinking about a one-liner with a checkbox, subject to 1031, yes, no, and then maybe we should say subject to buyer's 1031. Well, subject to mean they have an outlet that doesn't go through or it's just the intent to to do it maybe just the intent to do it it's just so. informational really right. so Which that when you say offer subject to i the, hear contingent yeah i do too so we may yeah. want to use different words for you know uh, 1031 and robin i know brought this up too, so i'm glad you stood up i did yeah thank you so uh this was a, a request from our farm and ranch right. forms task force that's contract right, task right. force Thank you. We have a paragraph in our commercial contract that, that we put out, and it allows both buyer or seller, you know, one, other, or both. Uh, and so, so it's something that was that was requested uh, that's common in these land deals, and yep. so that that was the request. Sure yeah. would be great if I could access those contracts. And typically what, what I've seen is a clause that says either seller or buyer uh, may close this transaction using the 1031 exchange, provided that it does not impose any obligation on the other party and does not delay closing. Wow, did somebody record that? That was good. That's I got one. But uh, what is an it? obligation? Because you do you have, have to sign documents there. Yeah, so. Then you start wondering what that is. Diane, Diane, that, that paragraph usually her. has like a cooperation. If it's just a notice, buyer or seller Although, I, I mean, I, I went to a 1031 seminar like two decades ago. And the guy who was doing it said, you know, you don't want to put anything in your contract because that might tip off the other guy that you have a deadline and then he's right. going to hold it over your head. Yeah. He says, just yeah. leave it blank. You don't need Whoa. the other guy to say anything. Yeah. You just you need don't to give him notes. Well, I yeah, don't have to I tell you what I do. You have, you have certain deadlines for you have to designate a mm -hmm. property by certain times. And yeah, once in a while I've seen people use that to their advantage that when they figure out it's 1031, they drive it down to the wire and get all kinds of extra concessions. They find so, out so, it's I mean, I've, I've, I know there are some people <laughs> that say, both ways don't on say phone. nothing. So we, we could, but we could, it's not necessary, but you could have an agnostic clause that you don't check any box that says either seller or buyer may participate in the 1031 exchange and the other side agrees to reasonably cooperate just Ooh. as long as it Ooh. does not adversely affect them or delay. Closing. Well, my concern there goes somewhat to the discussion of cash means cash, right? So cash before there's a, a distinction whether it's implied promise you're paying cash or not, yeah. right? So then if we have something in there saying it's 1031 or not, if you don't list it, are you then misrepresenting the deal getting into it? We're creating affirmative obligation <coughs> instead of to, to list it. No. I mean, if, no, you're, you're, if you're on the it, seller side, if you're doing a seller 1031, that's not relevant. If you're doing a buyer 1031, that means that the money is there. Right. Yeah. The the, yeah, that's right. Well, I, don't, I, I guess at some point I don't see why if it's governed by the tax code, it's not really our deal. Why do you have to tell why do you have to tell them your business anyways? I'm obligated to buy it in the contract. Why does the seller you know what I'm doing or the buyer or vice versa? Because it can delay and they are but I'm obligated to stick with it. You don't have to agree to my delay. Are these sophisticated I mean, parties that will have lawyers or themselves can write in like this? Yeah. 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 And that's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. Is 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 the issue solved by them just putting something in special provisions themselves? Especially in the farm and ranch world. I just I may not want to get in involved with you at all because your deal is a 1031. 
But if I have it, if I make delays and I realize I'm buyer and I'm going to have these other obligations that may come up because I'm trying to work another transaction or pick another property, you just say, I won't give you an amendment. I'm not extending. Yeah, but I've already wasted so much of time with you. You may not. Well, and you're you assuming I've breached my property and blah, blah, But blah, you've blah. assumed I've breached. I want to know up front. That's the point. I want to know up front before so that I, I don't get involved with Before you. I run off a bunch of other yeah. buyers, yeah. Right. I know what I'm getting into. The terms of a 1031 tax exchange, I, I went to a steward title seminar and the administrator said that there is wording that is supposed to be in special provisions. Now, is that a case by case or is there, what does 1031 come from? Uh, out Therefore, are there wording that we can look at to see if indeed the buyer is supposed to disclose in the contract? I want to know. It, the buyer has the money in the 1031. It's, it's yeah. there. And Scott has a comment here. Yeah, I mean, we're in the middle of a 1031 right now, and we've never seen a 1031 delay, delay closing. The NAR did a study. 27% of all 1031 exchanges involve single family residents. So if you do it in the farm and ranch, you probably have to do it in all of them. But That's a lot there, higher. There, there, like, the only issue is when you're in the 45 day process, you identify three properties and you theoretically put all three under contract, but all three of them are subject to inspections or whatever. I've never seen it delay a process. And we just put buyers, buyers doing a 1031 exchange. This and the commercial language just says the other party will incur no delays, no expenses, no anything. So I, I don't see the need to put it in, but if you do, you better put it in all of them. Because it involves a lot of single family. I said the rationale of Scott, you know, the, and I'm not trying to be arbitrary or kind of ridiculous about this, but if there's delay, then I want to know if you're in the pendency of the divorce. I want to know if this is in probate. I want to know if probate's huge. I want to know about probate. I want to know about divorce. I want to know about anything that's going to delay this contract that you obligated yourself to so I can already anticipate a breach that you actually haven't done yet, but I'm going to discriminate on your purchase that I don't want you here. Yeah, that's that's a good history. History. And I would yeah. say that's yeah, I want to hear a track history you sued people yeah. before. How many other contracts you backed out for? Did you look at the language that they have in this commercial? No, I was just it's a, it's <laughs> a, you back now. Oh, if you want to look at it. What do you mean like kind? Oh, like king. Yeah. <laughs> So if I took this, I'm to, really accurate. So if I took this to blank language, let's say it's fairly ag fairly agnostic. If you want to say just generic, they may do it to my people in Del Rio that have 36,000 acres that have been there since about 1820. They're going to freak out and not want to know what that is and not want to do with that buyer automatically. I just feel like the extra language is unnecessary. I agree. Just to, well, it's not there. Really a different idea. What if it? was an addendum, right? And you just had a, a box that's so not complicating the contract. You don't have to put it in there. Well, let's like, go back to, if, if you don't mind, Robin. Okay, this came from the Farm and Grant, Farm and Ranch Working Group at Texas Realtors, who also had worked with somebody else. I feel like, was Charles there? Charles, yeah, Charles. Charles was there. Yeah, so it, 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 did, it, it came just as a suggestion as we were looking yeah. at the changes that this group had previously made. So Farm and Ranch, the representation. Says you know, is there anything that you would like to see? And that was one of the things. Yes, we that did say that thing. because we were kind of doing a wholesale. We're doing a wholesale look. <coughs> okay. But then you're going to have some language here to, to suggest. Okay. And I, I just chopped up some. Either party may close this transaction as a tax deferred exchange pursuant to section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code, <coughs> provided the other party will not incur any additional obligation and closing will not be delayed as a result of the exchange. Okay, but like what Scott said, if we do that, we're going to have to put it more than every one of you got to put it in all you across put, the you board. Just, that would be just in it. What? <laughs> put it in every contract form? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's it's it against the ball. That's what that's 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 Especially when it trickles over to condo and residential. 
And I think that kind of sums it up, creating more problems than it would solve at the end of the day. It'd be, it'd be, can we add language? Yes, but what are we really doing? Right. Right. Well, are you having anything else, SJ, on that? I mean, I, we're not going to decide today, so I'm happy to marinate and save my comments for later. But, I mean, I do, I like having some information about, and yes, Tony has a valid point. I, I want to know whatever your problem is that's going to cause a problem for me later before I get in, in a deal with you. But do you really think the buyer's going to say that? I mean, we just lost a contract because the buyer thought his wife would, they're going through a divorce. It, he thought the wife would have no problem signing everything, and the wife basically said, kiss mm. off. <laughs> and so we lost the deal because the seller's not going to well, extend 90 days. Well, yeah, probate if, court if it's in the it. contract and they have to answer it, yes, I do think they will have, I mean, if they have to answer it, then I will know. How far do we go down that? Are you in the middle of the divorce? Is that appropriate? No, that's also public record. That's true. You know, so and somebody said, how many times have you sued somebody else? Again, that's public record. That's true. So hire your lawyer like you're supposed to, you know, you and do your, your own due diligence. Clients. If you, especially if you've got a, I don't know, that maybe is, a competition. Well, of, yeah, I think we're well, down the lines of not intending to do anything but we had the language up there if you can yeah. change the fourth word to close it's going to change either party and and we see if anybody has a strong feeling or a better I, argument at the next time and what 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 if talk about the property it. is not eligible for a 1031 does that give the up uh, the one of the parties now oh i thought i was going to do 1031 but then i was told that i can't well, for example, if it's a personal residence, you can't. Yeah, it's, it, oh, it's my personal residence. I can't do a 1031? Well, then. Okay, we'll have that language there, and we'll, we'll revisit this again. I think there's some requests for it, and we can marinate on that language. Um, okay, next one, number nine. The time period by which to make objections at the receipt of the items in paragraph six. Exception, documents, commitment, and survey. I believe the discussion on this last time, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, was when does the confusion being on when the deadline runs? Is it after all three of those are provided or mm -hmm. is it after the time each is. one is provided? And I, the collective understanding, I believe, is, is that it's after all three are provided is when that deadline starts to run. And then if you receive an, an amended survey, uh, you know, new survey or new title commitment, yeah, that timeline runs again from that new document. But before the original timeline runs, you have to get all three of those in. And I don't remember what the, other than there being confusion on that, um, what any of the issues were. It says blank days after buyer receives. Do we, so would you say buyer has received? I'm not sure that, I, I don't see the confusion I, in my I, own no. brain there. Um, We've understood it. It's not. <laughs> and there's an issue getting exception documents from title companies yeah. sometimes. But, yeah. Um, even the seller disclosure people know how to do that. <laughs> 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 All right. I'm not hearing a strong uh, opinion on that, so we'll move on. The next one uh, renewing the time, reviewing. reviewing the time periods in the addendum for the sale of other property by buyer. And I went through that before the meeting, and I didn't really see. I don't know what time periods would be difficult on that. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's a blank. Yeah. It's a blank, yeah. Is that an It is. It's, you know what? It's only <laughs> <laughs> the whole <laughs> auction <laughs> period. Oh, uh, yes, it is. It's the addendum, addendum for sale. Oh, oh, oh I think it, one one of the issues that was brought up was should we have the, you not have to pay all the earnest money, you know, right up front of her, pay an additional amount when you go in first. No, that's, that's, that's the, the backup. Backup back offer. Never mind. The oh. only thing I can think of is. Like I said, the option period yeah, because there, 
you know, they get their inspections and everything, oh, and then they don't sell their house. Well, I, they, they're, they're, and by the way, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I don't think we should change that. I'm fine with it being that way, but I think that's been the public comment. Gotcha. Yeah, the, the, the problem is <coughs> that they put in the wrong date in paragraph A. Oh, yeah. But that's, that's I can't well, fix that. Yeah. Don't put in such and such. So I, I didn't see any necessary changes there. Nobody else has any. Leak. I want to bold something. Consult an attorney somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so um, we reviewed it and we're blowing it off. Yes. Okay. Let's, no action. And no action. The phrase you <laughs> Delivery of bold remediation information that may be required by statute. Uh -huh. yeah. Is that the one you brought up? I don't know. I don't remember. But that is an interesting one. I think I probably did. I can hear that in my head. So would that be a required notice that falls under paragraph six? Right. Um, yeah, that's a good. Um, so statute requires bold remediation. Forever. Yeah. There is a yes. disclosure that, in, that you have to provide those house? reports. Yes. Is the question in the seller's disclosure? Oh, here we go. So wouldn't it? Well, is it a, is it a question in the It's not in the seller's, seller's disclosure, but it is a disclosure required in the statute that talks about mold and the the licensed well remediators. And it's, I can't remember what, where that is exactly at this very second, but but it is required, unless it's changed, it's required to be disclosed forever in every subsequent sale. Assuming people know about it. Well, if it's required. Yeah. So many years. If it is required, why would someone put it in the seller's disclosure? Oh, yeah. It's not well, but we need to talk required. to the legislature about that. It's 20 till 4. I mean, good God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you hungry? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, you know, seriously, it's not. No, that's not. Are we, is it close? Oh, you just went down to get it. Okay. So why don't we, this is a big one, why don't we take a break and I will pull up the law? Or do you want to just... Okay, let's keep marching through the other ones and we'll do that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. We're going to make this a shorter meeting than last time. Okay. All right, number number 12, conducting inspections before the option fee is paid. Are people concerned you, that... The right to inspect is not related to the option. Period. Well, a lot of people are arguing uh, if you haven't paid your option fee, you can't conduct inspections. You have they're a lot wrong. of. They're, they're, wrong. they're wrong. They're definitely yeah. wrong. It's education. <laughs> <laughs> Get in there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 yes. right? that, that's yes. a, that's a concern, not. though. It's like, I don't want you on my property until you actually pay it because but, these people are terminating before they try to terminate. But they've they don't signed have right. the contract and green allowed to inspect the property <laughs> reasonable <laughs> times. Yeah. yeah that's, well, you don't pay so it, the question is. I'm with her. They're wrong. You can't. They're, 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 you can't put somebody record. somebody we'll might uh, want to say seller may require payment of the option fee before buyer conducts their inspection. I think it's a but special provision. That's 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 but if they agree on Zap it. Education and yeah. five yeah. percent. Get a lawyer, write a special measure. You got one sentence. All right. <laughs> Class, oh, here's the great one. I missed this one yesterday last time. Classifying a stove as an accessory or fixture, as well as mirrors and other accessories. This is the old mirror. Um, <laughs> the old mirror dispute. But we did discuss last time of looking at that list, right? And, and seeing what actually needs to be on it. And I don't think it's something we can accomplish efficiently in this meeting. So it may be something to form a subcommittee to actually look at that whole thing, not just stoves, but what should be included in the <coughs> accessories and fixture examples. That looks like a bow subcommittee right there. Bow and some bow. <laughs> you're, you're Bo's only right to see uh, <laughs> leaving the committee. <laughs> yeah, yeah me, me, Bo, and, and Gary will look at this. Uh, Greg will look at this, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, in September, right? <laughs> <laughs> Can we say the refrigerator is not an accessory unless you say it is? Well, it, oh, it has been something that has been looked at in a long time. So I think it is hard. Do we have any volunteers? Is a refrigerator. Yeah. Does anybody want to volunteer? To I'll volunteer. All right. I'll volunteer, but I can only be nice and step right back. I was a, on it. 
Can Both be joining on behalf too. All right. right. She was, she's already got no. suggestions. <laughs> so she's, on she's on it. She's <laughs> on it. She's on it. Perfect. Hey, I got the add, Just add bathroom mirrors. <laughs> Seriously, if you added bathroom I'm going mirrors, no, I would because because would let's let let's let the committee subcommittee yeah, talk about it, and so we don't. Don't waste time okay. in the meeting. Mr. Today. Chair, if you want to go back to little XI, the law. Okay. Uh, We're back to uh, mold remediation now. And this is in the occupations code, which of course is a great place to put it. So the certificate of mold remediation duty of a property owner. And essentially look at if the property owner sells property, they shall provide to the buyer a copy of each certificate issued for the property under this section during the five years preceding the date <coughs> owner sells the property. So, so okay, I'm going to stand corrected. So it's five years before they sell the property. Right. It used to be forever. I think. I think it was. Came out, but it's five years before. Do we need to? <coughs> yeah, yeah. It was it before. was the counting back. <laughs> <laughs> so, but is this good law? Because you said Brian's wasn't with the Confederate holiday. Is this good? <laughs> 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 this is this is good. Uh, yeah. 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 This is legal. This is legal. This is legal. Is no, it was legal. Legal law. Legal law. Okay. So the the question is, do we need to add something in the contract? To direct people to this yeah, obligation. Par paragraph six is this too short. Up. We need to add another notice. This pops up. It I does mean, pop there, up. It, 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 it will pop it up. It does. It will pop up if there is mold remediation. This and I, will. If people don't know about it, I don't think, too. Even if they have it, they probably don't know. Boy, this would be required. right for the seller disclosure. And we just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's. No, we don't. Although, well, it, although this is legislatively required. It is, but it's required somewhere else. But maybe in 611, where we say mud, whatever, wicked, and pid. See, that's the list. Add it. Also say mode. Well, it, then now we're going to say and elsewhere throughout this contract. So, yeah, maybe it gets to be a just, number. Just add, or, or we just add more remediation to that. On 22. List. Well, it's not well, an addendum, though. So we added in 611, well, I though. We as were going to change that to addendum and other notices because. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. We got past that, we got past that discussion. I think. Are you for, crying? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I think it's important. I think if we're aware of a requirement. Then we should do it. Should it go in six? I mean, it should, I think, six, yes. matter of, if a whole nother subparagraph or just yeah, as part of the list that we already have started. So you want to look at six now? I think it would fit in there. Keep up for minutes yeah. and see where we put in the um, that, that 611 list and just add that to it. Yes. Mold yeah. remediation yeah. certificate. I got it. You just hold it one second. I can't. We're not. For example, we're not rushing. Lead, we're just talking. Yeah. 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 I chose not. It was the first one. Okay. So yeah. let me share it. All right. This is what we did first. Oh, is it going? Oh, there it is. But it says as described in the contract. Or other requirements. Yeah, yeah, we added this no. right here. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not no. described. No. No. Not yet. It's not saying it has to be. It's saying in addition to other notices. And no. other required notices described in this contract. It limits, limits it to the ones required. described in the contract. But Which couldn't you list not. it? Couldn't you say yes. all? Yeah. That's the point. We can take that out this described in this contract. Yeah. In other required notices, period. For I think I did that I first, and y'all overruled me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. keep it the same length. We put mold remediation and then take out that last. It, we won't be adding Well, anything. but if you add mold remediation, then you're making your list longer, and it... You're going to miss something. I, I That's a concern. It, it makes sense to set to give a notice. Adding, you're going to miss something. Code Section 1958 requires we'll sellers to give... Notice. Do you want its own item? Yes. Yeah. I think if you I want, if you're intending to bring people's attention, it needs. Yeah, yeah. It it is. Is. We did it with private transfer fees. 
Yeah. Okay, we ready to look at that? You all look at that? Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe put that back the way it was. And then uh, we'll add a uh, Dr. Wilson. <laughs> Wilson. <laughs> he needs his own his own section on the Okay, screen. so <laughs> that means number eleven is gonna get a yeah, three what, number. What if we 12. work on that so during lunch? Morning. Because it's going to take some and type something up that we can then review, so we don't yeah. do that. Um, so no, no, lunch is still not here, right? Not here. All right, so we'll we'll, we'll work on that during lunch and put language up on the screen, so we're not okay. trying to talk over each other there. Um, all right, so reviewing the new home contract forms we already talked about. Review the backup addendum. I think that's what the backup addendum issue. Okay. What was the issue on it? Um, the date. The date. So uh, uh, there was several requests for not having to put up all the earnest money up front, yeah. and then that, or to have it language where you put in X amount, and then when you went in the first place, you had to put in so much more and right. within so many days. Well, the most concerning thing is the option fee. Yeah, it's just but the option can't. money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's, I don't know what you can do about that because you're buying an option. Yeah. You have yeah. that option all the time. And I think, and, what, and the, the big concern I always have, I, I've had agents say, I want to bifurcate the option fee. I say, you're going to forget to pay that second option fee, and all of a sudden you've lost your option. Because no, you, you're going to sign the contract right. Right. and you're sitting around for two weeks and then you're told, you're oh, you out. become the, you become first place. Oh, wait a second. I'm out on vacation. Mm -hmm. I can't get the money to you. Well, the or, or, or they forget yeah, I mean, that there is a second piece of the option mm -hmm. fee. I'm really opposed to changing how we handle the option mm -hmm. in this because I would, I mean, in the beginning, which was a long time ago. I didn't get it and I had a problem with it, but now that I've used it so long and I understand it, I think it's golden. I, I just, I don't think we should change it. And as far as the earnest money, if you want to split the earnest money, you can. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, it, right. there's so I just don't see a reason to make a change to this form. No. Now, there, there's one thing that you might do is add a sentence that says the option fee must be paid and is non-refundable. Upon, must be paid upon execution of this contract and it is non-refundable even if you don't get into first position. I think I, I think that goes with saying, but a lot of people don't understand. I don't that. want to get into saying that because we're going to say it in all these different circuits. I, there's yeah, going to be, you'd have to say it everywhere. I want I think that's I think yeah. we've made that abundantly clear that the option never comes back. Why well, not sensing a strong desire to change well, anything uh, here? Well, wasn't there I can see some advantage to adding something in the back of addendum so that agents, when the buyer doesn't want to put a large amount of earnest money down, I mean, yes, you can go into using the additional option, uh, earnest money, but if they're in a backup position and the seller wants $5,000 as earnest money, and maybe $500 as option money, and there's no guarantee they're gonna to go to first place, that buyers and agents want to have a lesser amount down, pay the option money, they know they're not gonna get back, they're buying the right to be the only one in first place, and put down some earnest money, if indeed that's what the seller wants, but they also want their earnest money to be free to buy something else, because they can keep looking. So they're utilizing paragraph five to create that situation and clarifying the delayed funds in special provisions if and when they go in the first place. So they feel like they are practicing law by trying to write facts. So some consideration I was thinking we could make to the backup addendum, the place to be how much is being paid at the time the backup contract is executed with the additional earnest money and option fee being paid if and when the property goes into first place. So what's already there? The first place. I mean, well, when you're kind of manipulating the wording, because it says that the earnest money option fee is due within three days of the effective date, but if it's not the full amount, then you have to use the additional no, earnest I'm money. That on the back of the dental. Well, oh, if, you, if you're saying they don't pay the second part that you know this additional earnest money until they go into first place well the the backup addendum says 
Oh, now I'm thinking about the contingency. Yeah, I'm there's so no, sorry. Forget everything no, I said. I'll shut yeah, up. Yeah, you were saying about the addition. Yeah. To your point, they could be special provisions on the back of the addendum. You don't, you don't need to because if you look at 5A1, buyer shall deliver additional <laughs> earnest money of blank dollars to escrow agent within blank dates after the effective date of the contract. Yeah, but you don't know how many days. Yes, you have the there. amended effective date concept in the back of the day. Right. Yes. Right. But it doesn't say when you become the primary, right. then you have an amended effective. Just date. like it right. amends the termination option that says there's the effective right. date of the contract. So you do, option. yeah, you can yeah. say that within that number of days. And there's be... needs to be paid because they yeah, always yeah. have the option. Well, it says it right in the uh, back of the. No, I'm just saying it's a full option. Well, so like a thousand. Then they don't get an option. But I think I, mean, I don't think the back of addendum is used as much as it could be. It should be because the agents don't know how to handle paragraph five and the addendum. And maybe we could make the addendum more self-explanatory so they don't have to work. I just think it's a very rare circumstance for the back. We're just, there's more of it. It's but the last sentence in B. We may need some education, but I think it works well the way it is. Buyers notice 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 We'll say we're sending this up for option and we'll addend, we'll make an amendment to our option when we go in first place. And I've never had another agent saying, I'm talking about problem. what uh, it was a release of earnest money. But you know what I'm saying? But the option con, they didn't get the option and they wanted their earnest money. They thought they were getting their option for back to which they didn't. But as just, I'm saying, as an agent, I just say go yeah, low I mean, on option until you go in first place and we will mm -hmm. amend it. When we are in first place, and if I communicate with yeah, the other agent, right. you should not no, have any problem. Yeah. It's free money. And if I'm the seller, I'm not taking your little pinchy that's right. earnest money. I want the big earnest money, but you don't want to give it to me because you don't want to no. sell your money while you're shopping. But if I'm in second yeah, place, you then you already have the big money from the first place. That means greed on their side. <laughs> Friday night. And are you doing, <laughs> and are you doing a 1031? <laughs> are you getting divorced? Are you bankrupt? And are you about to die? Well, I'm sensing no, this. Probate. Yeah. I'm sensing this isn't a dead issue, but that the the overwhelming consensus is that not to change anything right now. But I think that it is point well taken in practice. Is there a way to make it simplified instead of trying to piece together the, the language? And so maybe we. We look at it, or if we can come up with some language maybe for the next meeting that we can look at and propose that that would be helpful. Uh -huh. Is there anybody else interested in looking at you know putting some ideas together on changing it? Yeah. I mean, it would not be complicated to do it. We just add a paragraph that says additional awesome. earnest money effect you know, within three days of the amended effective date must yeah, be paid exactly. to That's so escrow good. agent. <laughs> It's, we yeah. really, really <laughs> need. <mean. laughs> I mean, seriously. How, I mean, it's not, and it could be part of. The, it makes sense to have it as part of the backup contract. Yeah, that's, that's or, 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 add, or since any yeah. any additional earnest it's money not, is governed it's by it's paragraph I no. one of the contracts. No, You're I think it needs to be. It needs to go in the backup because it's not applicable to anything yes. except the backup contract. Well, let's, let's work on that. Let's work on that. And I think Ron had some comments at last meeting. Well, you want to so make right sure they include him. Okay. I just I, yeah, I think it's already right. right. here, so he does need to. No, you're gonna do it later. Yeah, let's do that later. Keep us. We need to do that. Let's not say no action. So you and John and Diane are committee. And Ron. You better bring him on. He's not here. Long told. 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 Long a separate document. Yeah. They almost always come back to title, trying to say you screwed up the tax. They just came out later. And we're in the middle of it. You're not. Anymore. We're not, not anymore. That's true. That's <laughs> <No>. <laughs> from the outside. Uh, 
So I, I'm, I don't think there's any action we need to take on it. And theoretically, the parties can agree to a different proration. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I, I str I've i struggled over this for enough years. Um, there's no one right way to do it if things change. And, and as a title company, I... I <clears throat> He, the closers say, "Well, what do I do? what do I say?" And I say, "It's your contract. You tell us how you want to do your prorations, and that never works. You let's, know, let's they they the want us to tell them, but you know, there's so many different permutations on how prorations can change because of changes in assessed values, change, removal of exemptions, addition of exemptions." Can we just have them assess the tax bill protests. taxes January 1st of the taxable year? <laughs> <laughs> One size not going to like that. <laughs> it, yeah. it works. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not perfect, but I don't know any way to change it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, unless somebody has any other comments, we'll move on from that one. Food is close. All right. So we're down to the last bullet point. So. Be, and then we can maybe start working on language, but it's not here yet. But the last one's review of the Agricultural Foreign Investment Disclosure Act. And I seem to recall this was either Robin or Charles. Or not here anymore. No, don't we think it's fixing to change? Maybe? Yeah, should, we maybe we should just hold no, this off. No, no. This okay. is the federal law. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm saying, but maybe we can address both of them. Once we know what the state law is, we can address They're different. both of them. They're different. So, my best part is distracting the language. That works yeah. for together both. that works for both. Yeah, I, I thought what we're talking about is just adding it in the same uh, paragraph 20, right? So yeah, uh, maybe, but look, they're not the be. same law. So is a I, seller. We understand it's not the same law, yeah. but it's a similar issue that sure. should be addressed at that time, I think is what we're saying. Oh, well, it's called federal tax yeah. requirements. We're going to have to rename that sucker. So do we want to just say defer until legislative session? I think so, and then we can work on yeah. it all We're together. Don't you want to look at it? By the way, if, if <laughs> I could, just, we do just that a, a little update. That's right. You're not getting the buy. An update for everybody. That'd be good for the October. Today, a new bill. <laughs> You're going to look at it. Today, a new bill everything. was introduced. <laughs> HB 2788. HB 2788. And I kind of like this one because it puts the onus on the seller. A buyer has no, or I, I'm sorry, it puts the onus on the buyer. A seller has no obligations. The conveyance is not voided at all. It just provides a post-closing remedy for the comptroller and the AG to get together and say, hey, you violated the law and you better get rid Ooh, of that it's a property. criminal offense. And you, you better get cheese. rid of it. And if you don't, <laughs> don't, you don't, if you don't, if you don't sell it, she sees attorney's fees. <laughs> yeah. what, what does it say if you don't? It, 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 basically, hey, you bought a property and you weren't allowed to. You committed an offense. And you better get rid of it. And if you don't, we're going to divest you. And we're gonna, you're gonna forfeit fifty percent of the value. Is that what it's? I, yeah, fifty no. percent of the market this value. This is the contract. Okay, this is the contract to, to one forty-seven, I believe. Believe it or not, I'm on an email chain with all these people about this. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> Do you know that I'm a lifetime member of the Texas Asian Republicans? Lifetime member. Oh, you I didn't said, know that. I did. Little background it. that you didn't know about me. Anyway, this is uh, Representative Jaton. This is saying that an alien has the same rights, personal and real property rights, as a U.S. citizen. So this is a competing bill. So. Oh, is that a state legislature? Yes. I think with that, we'll take our lunch break. Uh, we can read it all. I haven't read it. Unfortunately, we, we're down through all the comments. We're back on the record. We'll give one minute. Somebody get settled here. And so we'll, first, we'll circle back to this discussion about the certificate of mold remediation that is required by the Texas Occupations Code. We did confirm that. 
And the statute provides that you have to provide the certificates for the preceding five years um, after the mold has been remediated. So if it's within the last five years. Actually counting back from the sale of the property. The sale of the property. Five, five years. years back. Okay. The certificate was issued within the five years. And, it, so if and it, it has to be issued within 10 days after the right. remediation is done. <laughs> so what we have is... <laughs> We're not getting into the counting side of this, fortunately, but what we're talking about is the disclosure that should go into the contractor or not. And I think the collective thought is it's probably good to put it in paragraph six. And so during lunch, uh, SJ was kind enough to draft some proposed language for us. Let's see it. So I'm suggesting this be the new number 11 as the last actual disclosure item and the <coughs> 11 which is the hey you have to disclose these move down to number 12 with the warning and so to read it out loud uh, this certificate of mold remediation if the property has been remediated for mold seller must provide each certificate of mold remediation damages issued under or under by should be uh, under well uh, i'm tracking the language from under by from the no, not under by. Sorry, under. Sorry, uh, I don't think the you. word damages. <laughs> is it, it is. It is <laughs> under the statute number, occupations code, and this is formatted like we have the other sections formatted. Occupations code in the five years preceding the sale of the property, which that language is admittedly somewhat confusing, but it's right out of the statute. So we wanted to follow the right. statute as close as we could. And. I don't know if this will, if I can change while we're, the certificate if it'll change online. Let me show you real quick the certificate itself. So the certificate itself is promulgated by the insurance commissioner. There it is. And it is the stupidest name certificate showing this property does not have mold damages how can you do that it's really a certificate of mold damage remediation and that's maybe he's so and it's filled out by the contractor it is filled out by the contractor right and so this is something that's signed by the the contractor in Somebody else, right? We the, get the, the certificate shows up when they do the remediation because I've done two listings. Yes. Well. And then we just attach it to the seller's disposal. That'd be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is required by the seller's disposal. Is it required by the seller's disposal? Well, it is required. Okay, again, it's on the Texas Realtor seller's disclosure. Yeah. It is not on 5008. 5008. And this is. A required notice, right? So yes. we would fit within the required notice section. The one of the issues that was raised is when do we stop listing things? And I don't think we have a end when it's required <laughs> notice, right? And so these are this is the one notice out there we now know is required that it's not listed. It's certificate of mold damage remediation. Hold on. It is certificate of mold damage remediation. Correct. Thank you. Certificate of mold. It did read funny. That's what they issued. Yes. Well, I mean, I guess. Well, it is tracking the statute. Well, the statute is one way, and yeah. the the certificate has a different name. So, but should the heading on a wedding say certificate of mold damage remediation? Is well, wrong? because I'm, again, I'm tracking mm -hmm. the. Statute, and then in the body, I'm calling it the Certificate of Mold Damage Remediation because that's the title of the certificate. They do not match. That's correct. So should, okay. should we capitalize the either make lowercase the certificate or capitalize lowercase. the rest of it? Lowercase. That's correct. But uh, you know, actually, this the one. It's the one that is the document. It has a capital C, and all the rest are lower. It's, 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 I'll look at it again. I'll show you again. Hold on. 
open share tray. There it is. So <laughs> stupid. Obviously, they do not have a insurer, lawyer, <laughs> broker company <laughs> over there at the insurance company. They could have asked us. We did. <laughs> right. So that's the that is the name of the certificate. What? Oh, no, sorry. We time on it. Here is the law. Oh, that's the wrong law. Here is the law. And here is where I'm getting the certificate of mold remediation. That's the name of this. Well, I think so. A that's why I think that's what it ought to be called. I like it. It's short. Go back it's to your Yes. Please. Yes. Please. If I can get Please. there. I, I may have to again I need to go back and change. Hold on. I gotta go open my share tray. Open the share tray. Here we go. I'm gonna take a class in this Microsoft Good Teams. You're great. What? During the five the statute. That's not During. what the statute the says. During the five years proceeding. Oh yeah. I said that. In the during so instead of in the occupation during said in the could we say not earlier can we also, than also we have a rule in that set of standards that has not been published that we're gonna write in English when we can. Except when following the statutes. Well, we're not following it exactly. I have changed it a little bit to try to be more legible. Five years. That's fine. Fine. Yep, I'm fine with Jeremy. Does anybody have any? Pure prose there, Ms. Swanson. Okay. Well, then, so we're going to, okay, and then we're going to renumber. The other one, 12. It's going to be 12, and I will. <laughs> Oh, you know what that is? Ha! Huh. It's up here now. It was the first thing we worked on. Yeah. So. So now it's going to be this. Our minutes are going to be a little cuckoo. And I'm going to suggest that when we get to that point, we defer the minutes to, because <laughs> we'll never be able to leave. Yeah. Because we don't have Ron. We're doing the best we can. A, We're doing the best we can. What you have. Say, here's what happens when you're not here. So we're sort of revoting now. I think we're revoting on what we've previously voted on 11, which is now going to be called 12. I think Correct? we're good with that by consensus. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, so you want to send that to me? and I'll Yes, ma'am. Very good. Oh. Greg, did you want to bring up your wholesaler uh, issue? This, this is <coughs> deferred from a past meeting as well. That wasn't actually on the list. Um, yes. Oh, good. That was up there. Right. Underground version. Underground. There's been a lot of conversation about wholesaling and such, and a, a friend of mine in Wichita Falls had a transaction recently that a buyer <clears throat> presented himself as buying the home for an elderly mother, but then later on, unbeknownst to them, right before closing, went ahead and signed that contract. They actually got signed twice before closing. It made for kind of a rub because the seller, number one, thought I was selling it to this little old lady type thing, and then it turned out to not be that. And then, of course, also seeing that it sold for a much greater sale price than what they sold for. So the thought was, is, is should there be anything in the contracts that would just talk about whether or not a property would be assigned at the beginning? So that's that's really the, the crux of the, the conversation. And let me throw a couple of things on the plate, and then I'll oh, uh, get to you there. No, the other thing with wholesalers is whether there should be some disclosure up front too in addition just for similar to the the notice cash means cash right i'm going into this contract and intending to assign it to somebody else 
and is that an important enough issue? And it, it happens a lot, I know, in, especially in the Houston area, it happens all the time. Yeah. And getting the, you know, we do have, if they're an agent, right, we have the rules that have provided BPO and, and do these things when they're buying it in their own name, then assign it later. But if it's they're not agents, there's nothing there. They need to freely assign it. And what frequently happens is they go from house to house to say, hey, do you want to sell it? Do you want to sell it? And get the contract where the closing date's the same day the option is. And they've been, you know, it's all these crazy things that happen. So those cases, I don't think we can police, right? Those guys are going to do what they're going to do. But the disclosure part of it and, and going into it, if I think one of my buying or selling decisions is the old lady's going to get it, I want her to have it. Well, you should tell me you, you intend to sign it up for them, um, if, if that's the case, because I won't tell you. But traditionally, these contracts have been considered to be assignable, you know, left as is, track contract. But you know, we could put a checkbox because I was thinking about the same thing, just a checkbox that says this contract may not be assigned, or checkbox this contract may be assigned, you know, and that maybe would disclose it up front. Um, I mean, that's just real simple. But yeah. The, the flippers are out there, and they are a problem. I've got a case up on the appellate court right now. But, uh, well, that, but, that is a material change to the law. The state yeah. of the law in the state of Texas is that contracts are assignable. You, unless, unless, they're yeah, un unless, unless it's, they're not. Yeah, yeah. Un unless, unless it's they're personal. Not. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not. Un unless, unless, unless there's unless they some they personal not. aspect. <laughs> or I'm giving you seller financing. <clears throat> well, you're Ross Perot, but you, Ross Perot cannot. Do you well. think that just... There is law on the personal the, the personal nature of the obligation. You can, yeah. can okay, so override it. Amazing, but, but, but in general, the you're, property, I agree. The but, contra that contract would be... But that's, that's the exception, not the rule. And, exactly. um, so the, the question here is, do we want to create an obligation for disclosure? And if we create an obligation for disclosure, does that then, like cash, be, if you don't if, if you change up your financing, right, and our new other finance, you have to then amend the contract. Same kind of issues we're discussing there, popping to my mind. But. So instead of a checkbox, could we, if we agree we want to make a change, in the parties paragraph, could we just say, unless otherwise agreed in writing, this contract is not assignable? Yeah. And I think that goes to S. Trace. I got the thumbs up from Brian. Brian. You have to see. I got the thumbs up from Brian, but go ahead. Yeah, it's on camera. It's on camera. But it, that does materially change, sea change, yes. and what the what our contracts provide for now. And, I and yeah, obviously it was, it's material. I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight, but I think if if the statute says they're assignable unless they're not, then we do have the freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. So or, I wouldn't be opposed to it we've all, unless you talk me out of it. And this came up a couple of years ago because there's a Trek rule about equitable interest, and it was added to legal one and two, probably two editions ago. So uh, maybe if it's never gone away, it's for full disclosure to the parties. It would make sense to have the parties disclose if they're going to do it. Uh, by that, I mean assign it to someone else so that the seller's aware. When the seller's not aware and deals fall through because the buyer can't perform because he really wasn't buying it himself, that's what created the whole thing. And again, I don't remember the number of the Trek rule, but it, it's there. Can I and just jump rule in was, real quick, too? Sure. Um, this may be relevant for this discussion as well. We are anticipating um, some legislation, it hasn't been filed yet, but anticipating some legislation that would actually also require in the wholesaling um, context disclosure to the seller. Right now there's just a requirement to disclose to the buyer. Um, and so we we're expecting to see that legislation, which may be <coughs> part of your concern. So it may be something you want to defer okay. until cool. we see. Very good. That and, well, so and there's the rule too that to market an equitable interest, you have to have a license now. Is that part of this this rule change? If you're, yeah, because if you if, 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 if you don't have yeah, the ability to actually buy it yourself, which is the way a lot of these flippers work, they don't really have the cash, they don't have the credit, so they go ahead and, and take over. They <clears throat> they just talk somebody. Excuse my expression, a little old lady to sign the contract at something well below market price. They then shop it to buyers who, you know, will pick it up, but it's by assigning the contract that they, they get it. But in, and, and if it's like, listed in the MLS, and this is the other thing, this is not our rule, this is not the law, but if it's listed in the MLS, maybe a part of our rule, 
they have to say if they only have an interest in the contract. So That's what I recall. Second down mm -hmm. the line, they only have an interest. They don't. Right. And then you have a license still to market that. Or, you have to yeah. have a license to put that on. Someone yeah. subscription. Yeah. I guess maybe else or something. That's not 25, 30 emails no. a week. Hold so on, we're getting some. Getting no, there, it, it's, uh, there's two provisions. Um, one is uh, what I think you're you're talking about, which is actually in our license act, um, and it basically says if you fail to disclose that you are only conveying okay. an interest, yeah. then um, that becomes trouble. unlicensed activity. Right. So if you disclose, yes. you don't get okay. licensed. <laughs> Statute, okay. but that's that's in statute. And then we have a corresponding rule that goes along with it. There's also another provision in the property code in Chapter 5 that addresses this as well, but it's just among the parties. Chuck doesn't have any jurisdiction there. So. But still, we should probably wait and see what the legislature yes. does before yeah. we do anything yeah. more. Okay. And I would love, by the way, Trek education to include something that says you do not add and or assigns to the buyers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Can we go back just a tiny bit to the prior issue? My uh, <coughs> colleague here improved our improvement. We didn't have the words to buyer in the, uh, but this is back on the mold. So I'm going to pop it up with the improvement. We just added two buyer. So much seller must provide two buyer each certificate of mold damage remediation. Blah blah blah. So okay. I'm sure y'all like that better than what we already feel. Yeah. And just so. a question: Is this something that needs to be provided before executing the contract? And is there any right associated if you don't provide it? Or what is the right associated? I guess. Good question. Excellent question. Good question. Excellent question. And Go to the law. Yep, open my share tray. Okay. <clears throat> well, there's some, I need to look at that. The you know who's in charge of this is the insurance commissioner. So there may be rules describing it don't say what no. It may be another, what's the next statute? Well, they haven't paid close attention to it because they didn't work track. That's, that's true. <laughs> and that hit the nature of that form. I, you know, it's still, uh, it's a material matter. You better disclose yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But the question we, we disclose the, question the deal. Is, I think. If, you, if you disclose it on 10 days after the contract and, you know, they've got the seller disclosure right ahead of time and their option period was seven days. Do they have any recourse if they see this and go, oh, I didn't know about this. Yeah. I'm well, saying we that, just closed and funded. Yeah. I wanted to hand this to you. There's not yeah. a stat, doesn't appear to be a statutory remedy. Um, and this is poorly written and let me see. We can key side it in between now and the next meeting and uh, see. Uh, See what cases come up or anything. Because yeah. if it was if it was part of the seller disclosure, that'd be easy. Does the form, already be does the form, form say anything? Form? I think so. <coughs> it's just you no, just give the form. Weak. That's just given by the remediator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I don't think the remedy would change our language that we propose now. I, mean, I think I think it's something that's material that there's a common law obligation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this would definitely to, this right, bolsters this would, the common law obligation. This would be fraud or real estate yeah, exactly. transaction. Blah, 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 blah. But yeah, I don't think. Oh, could you go back to your your language? Yes, I do not. I think there is a statutory. I'm going to give you something that I think you're oh, going to do. Of course you are. You're personally pushing this not, past 130. Not, <laughs> SJ's going to like this. It's not me. But no, you're going to like this. 130. After code, you need to put a comma. Yeah, I didn't put there on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I didn't put there on purpose. It's not necessary. Yeah, I kind of agree with history yep. on that one. 
Let's see. Nope. Nope. The grammar Nazis say I'm right. Common needed. Okay. Yeah. You can um, over commification. And this is not <laughs> Just keep it Oxford only. Uh, well, okay. On that note, we'll, uh, I think that, that change is a good, good change. Good pick up on that. We'll uh, take that and go forward. So the Next agenda item is discussion and possible action regarding recent court cases. And we have one case that's attached here, which is the uh, Yvette Branch versus Laura Maskell and C uh, Cobalt Banker. And what happened in this case was the, is an interesting one. There's some underlying litigation. One of the parties tried to back out of the contract and then they had a, a mediated agreement where the parties came back together to sell it. And during this process of reinspecting the property <laughs> under the, the litigated agreement um, or mediated agreement, the seller's agent went out to the property. Had a key, went out to the property and set up heaters to prevent damage from happening. Later on, mold was discovered, and it was alleged that the listing agent, uh, uh, listing agent did not disclose the mold and exacerbated the mold problem by putting the heaters in there. Yes. And the core issue in the case, though, was attorney's fees. And because that was not contractual and is based more upon negligence and, and fraud, does the, the contract, the track contract, allow the recovery of attorney's fees um, in, in that case under paragraph 17? And this was both the agent and the listing broker. The, the, they won. The listing broker and the agent won the case, right, on summary judgment. And the, uh, the court ruled that, yes, you don't need to have a contractually based cause of <coughs> to recover attorney's fees. It's broad, and the listing broker and the agent in this case do. They didn't distinguish them. Could recover their defensive attorney's fees under paragraph 17. And so that, that's what I took the main thrust of the case is just affirming the fact that related parties, including the broker, <coughs> non-contractual claims can use paragraph 17 to recover their attorney's fees. Yeah, well, they, only the non-parties that are named. The non-parties that are named, but but the agent was included, <clears throat> and they said. Yeah, but they didn't. They didn't really talk about no, the agent. They didn't get the into the issue. It. And mm -hmm. let me clarify one thing: sure. the mold was actually allegedly was found first. Allegedly. Yeah. And then the heaters were set up, and this very unhappy seller lady who had to pay attorney's fees because Elizabeth then she tried to blame it on the mold, and it really. That wasn't the thing. Yeah. It was ultimately an attorney's fees case and also about procedure, about summary judgment. So. It's just one of those cases that you get in and it's snake bit from the beginning, it sounds like, mm -hmm. and stayed snake bit all the way through. I thought some other guidance from this case was um, this is back on the um, property approval and the buyer approval, and there was a mistake made in the notice that was given to terminate. So they gave um, the agent, okay, so this is what the agent's in there. The agent on the termination notice check marked the box indicating the contract is being terminated pursuant to the appraisal addendum. But it wasn't. It wasn't the appraisal addendum. It was the property approval. And so that was a, and the court didn't really go into that other than pointing out that that was a big mistake. And then there was some um, notice timing and the value was anyway. Well, that was part of the original dispute that then they mediated right, right. to go back under contract because it was whether they properly terminated right. it or not. But they lost and that's why they mediated. So they did lose in the trial court. It's just the court bill didn't have to go back and yeah. reevaluate. But it has some lessons like follow the rules and be careful. And it, this is one case in particular, it's written in pretty plain language. It's not very mm -hmm. legalese. And so it's a, it's a good case for, I, mean, yeah, I wish they had more points than just attorney's fees with how they wrote it, because there's not many cases he did written this plainly. But it's, it's a good one to read if, if, if you haven't already. I've come up with one that came down very recently from my firm. I'll send it to you, sir. Who do I send it to, certainly? Um, you can send yeah. it to me or Amber. Or okay, her. Yeah. Same concept, the Dallas Court of Appeals affirmed the award of attorney's fees to the uh, agents who won on summary judgment. The agents. 
See, that's the brokerage. The, thing. the brokerage. Yeah, the brokerage. Yeah. The brokerage. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Words have meaning, but they, they do. do. <laughs> <laughs> that Ron attached in regards to oh the, uh, to the calculation right. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. I have just a quick thing I wanted to bring up that's going to be a legal issue probably I don't know that there's anything we want to do with it it's not really a case although there are some cases <coughs> about this already so you know there's lots of municipalities that are starting to <coughs> regulate or require registration for people that want to short-term rent their houses, like the Airbnb and the RBO and kind of things. And there are some lawsuits about those. I've not seen any that have gone up to the Court of Appeals. And I don't know if that really is ever going to get to our point, as uh, John and I talked about before. We, I don't think we start talking about zoning because that's... Slippery slope. No, I mean, that's public. Go do your own due diligence. Yeah, essentially, but nothing yet. It's a topic of interest, but I thought there was a case, and maybe we'll look it up. I, I'm trying desperately to remember the name. Was it Timber Walk or Timber something? Yeah, it's in Houston. And yeah. it was 2018, and that had a short-term Airbnb type rental. And they, there were two issues. One is that a residential use, because the HOA said renting it out on an Airbnb is a commercial use and therefore violates the no, you know, uh, we can't have commercial use of property. But I think they also said that wasn't in your governing documents at the time of this thing, so you can't retroactively. Right. Well, but, but they did have a, a no business, you know, type provision and, they, and that's what they're trying to use to stop it. And the court said, no, it had to be more specific than that, right. like you're saying. Right. Story. And then the other one, uh, there was one other aspect to that case. So one was the commercial and the other was it wasn't a residential use. Yeah. And uh, the court ruled that it was a residential use and right. that also But again, we're in we're in real specific I'm kind of wishing I wouldn't have brought this up now. But, <laughs> um, as far as disclosure requirement or changing the contract, I don't think we're I don't think there's anything that needs to be done. Well, in, in the, that discussion right there, though, helps solidify that because mm -hmm. it really is fact specific it is. And, and it's not required by statute. And if we got into to zoning things and HOA things for disclosure, yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it opens it up to right. a huge Pandora's box there. Well, OK, right. let's tie it back in. OK, if you're in an HOA, then we need to do the mandatory. Yep. Yeah. And, you should, look at it and you should look at that and you should do your due diligence because if you're buying it to be an Airbnb person, you wouldn't want to buy it. And put it in six, the 60, is it 60 objections or, or the list of the use yeah. of the property? Yes. Short term rental, right. then so you would have an out once you got the documents. The, in. the biggest thing is the permitting issue. I mean, <coughs> even my tenants, that's what they do Austin permit for short term rentals. So I've learned a lot mm -hmm. how people are getting around it because it, it can be your primary right now to get a permit. So they just change their mind. But again, that's super, that's specific to Austin. Right. You know, right. Fort Worth is doing a registration. Fredericksburg is different. Corpus, yeah, every, is everybody is Corpus. different. Corpus, 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 I had to permit mine. Yeah, everybody's different. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the biggest problem I see is that when they go to the title company, the title company is required to put, you know, the reference to where the homeowners association rule, I mean, uh, documents are found in the record. And I think our contract does call for them to deliver that, but a lot of times it doesn't get delivered unless you ask the title company and above all offer to pay for it because it may cost you uh, a little bit. If you get a hundred, if you get something like Woodlands or something, you're looking at, I wouldn't say a phone book, but you're looking at a lot of regulations. Whereas there's some of these HOAs, it's like two or three pages of sprinkling stuff in the middle of this. So. Yeah. And easy to read, much easier to review. So more due diligence. If you're looking to buy a property for that, make sure you do your due diligence. Uh, any other cases anybody's aware of? Okay. So discussion, possible action regarding future agenda items and meeting dates. So we have a future meeting date of June 9th, which will be after this session. We'll see if there's any special sessions after that. Um, any topics anybody would like to add to the future agenda item that we can look at? We've already talked about several today. Okay, with that, um, 
Do Let's see, the meeting minutes. At, How do we want to handle that? Do you okay. want to look at uh, a July meeting date, potentially? In case there's a special session? Just in case there are a lot of legislative changes. Yeah. And, uh, I think, I think the, the date we yeah, typically we reserve is on July yeah. 14th. That is not going to work. It's best deal. By the way, no, actually, it would. So we're going to have a whole day. It's just a whole day. Save the day. Lee is saying, what about the 21st? You said no to the 14th. I lied. Is this July? Oh, July. 21st. Wait, wait. The day of the 14th was proposed. I've withdrawn my. Objection. <laughs> I'm out on the 14th. But July 14th? Yeah. How is July 21st? That would be your last meeting, so we really need oh, to get yeah. here. You guys already yeah, did that. Cause I, how is the 21st? On the What's that? The, uh, uh, July 14th, 14th is an option. Really? really? Okay. Because it's already on my calendar. Yeah, I think it's what we, we, we reserved. But do we want to move that to the 21st? As a, I do, because I really yeah, want to vote. Yeah, we're on both. You're in first place. But the rest of the week, I'm here. The rest of the month, I'm here. Well, we don't want to do a 4th of July, Bo. I don't either. So the 27th? We don't really. <laughs> he doesn't really say anything. He's on his way out. He's extremely busy. No, I think it's that week. It's a nice that option. No, he was that final. Well, it didn't work for me. I can't do the 20. For me, it is. I really. What day are we so saying in July? We, we may be getting a little too close to the August meeting date for posting if it's that late. Because um, mm -hmm. we'll have to post. The so 7th does, does not work for me. <clears throat> And that's Fourth of July week. A lot of people take that yeah, week off, like correct. me. What if we looked at a, a Monday meeting on the tenth or something? We have done Monday meetings before. Okay. Um, I can do the tenth. That may be. I'm going to check with Amber. That may be an exact meeting. I. Okay. I can do the tenth. I can't do the tenth. I could do the tenth. I'll be coming in tan for my vacation. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> What about this? Well, and let's just look at one more 17th. I can do that. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm yeah, I can do the 17th. I can't do this 17th. I got a federal court trial. Hey, I was open for the rest of the month. All right, this is Survivor. Who do we want to kick off the? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You need to I think, I think we're going back to the 14th. Oh, we just got cut off. Even what we're going to go back to the 14th. Uh, well, the 17th is another committee meeting, okay. and I think the 10th is likely. I think that's why we came up with the 14th month room. Yeah. Go oh, cancel whatever you had planned on that day. Can you do it? Uh, no, but that's okay. So this is your mind. Mind. So, we got a. We're going to accommodate well, your look, schedule. This is also a How holiday. About it may not even happen. He may be there in June. What if we do Thursday the 16th? This is a backup day. Yeah. No, the this 16th would not be is his Sunday. last week. It's Sunday. 17th is a Monday. The 13th. I'm talking about Thursday. 13th. That'd be the 13th. 13th. The 13th. Thursday the 13th. That's <laughs> lucky day. I probably did. Oh, good. I thought That's I a lucky day. You probably didn't. You can't trust the 13th. So are we yeah. still looking June 9th if there's no special session? Yes. Okay. Yeah. This is just Maybe. a backup day. Okay. Maybe. It's not just if there's a special session. It's how many laws. Yeah, so we, yes. may need, we may need to meet so July. July. After session, we've had a June and then a July meeting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So unless you really didn't need the July meeting, I would anticipate having okay. a July meeting. So you're gonna, so we're planning on June and July. 13th? Yeah. So could you do the We're planning on June and July. Or, I, can make yeah, I don't think the 13th. Well, you tell us your schedule. We'll, yeah. We'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> what day do you have over that? The 20th. The 7th. Maybe on Friday, on Friday, July 7th. I can do the 7th. I can do the seventh, and I'm. I just cannot do the seventh. That is Fourth of July. That's candy. <laughs> but you have anything, or you're just holding it? I no, I have tickets. Oh, I'm gone, okay. and that is Fourth of July week. What I'm about the twentieth? Have... That's a Thursday. The what? The twentieth. I can't do the twentieth. I booked. Let the me last ask day. you something. <laughs> okay, Bo, let's, Bo, let's, are you coming to the June meeting? Yeah. Can we have a celebration with you in June? And if you miss the 14th, are you calling yeah, in? That's so what we're doing on the 14th. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Brilliant. Okay. Okay. How about that? That's, I You'll think, be in I person. I think that's what we okay. put us on. So you'll even have a June meeting if 
Yes, yes. Like, we special. will yeah. have both. That's okay. the thing. We will okay. have both. Okay. Okay. So not tied to special session. It's just after the legislative session. Okay, so we're back to the 14th. All right, okay. ladies okay. and gentlemen, please put on your calendar on a, Thursday, June 8th. This is Thursday, June. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, this is not an official meeting, actually. So after this, this is not an official meeting, but if there is a gathering of friends at which there will be no business conducted Absolutely. whatsoever, so there will be no violation of the Open Meetings Act, I will send you a private message later that has nothing to do with work for like the BLC. After hours on the 8th in order to have that meeting. That's exactly, exactly. it. After hours, non it's open, yeah. no meeting. Is it possible together. there that any of us eligible for the 100% <clears throat> attendance pin will receive it then? It's possible. <laughs> Anything is possible. Are, are we also scheduled to do one in August? No, because of the track meeting. No, because these two will, you will take care of both meetings. <coughs> yes. Both meetings. No, no August. The 9th, Correct. I think, yeah, I'm so, going to be at a wedding. Yeah, the, the meetings, to, we'll get back on the normal meeting schedule after that, so the next should be October. <laughs> he keeps changing the date. It was supposed to be. It was supposed to be the. Okay. Well, do you mind if the rest of us don't have to go to the wedding? Yeah. <laughs> but it was supposed to be the third, and all of a sudden they moved it to the tenth. Okay. So June 9th and July seventh, July fourteenth. Fourteenth. June 9th, July fourteenth. Her team right. is um, <laughs> With no further business, a motion to adjourn. Motion adjourned. Second. 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 All right. right. Meeting adjourned. Yeah. You're, you're going to distribute minutes. Yes. Yeah. So, what I was going to suggest is I'll send them to Abby and let Abby send them out.